Hi, welcome back to part three, the final part of my Depth Be Heard series. Thank God. Unless Amber wants to call me. I'm recording this one at my parents' house instead of my tiny apartment with paper-thin walls, so for everyone who likes to complain about how annoying my voice is, it's gonna be louder this time. But let's just pick up where we left off. So from 2016 to 2022, one of the biggest issues surrounding Depth V Heard was just the complete lack of well-sourced information. Trusted publications covered this story initially when Amber filed for divorce and then a restraining order, and soon after, Amber and Johnny settled, releasing a joint statement saying, Our relationship was intensely passionate and at times volatile, but always bound by love. Neither party has made false accusations for financial gain. There was never any intent of physical or emotional harm. The two then reportedly signed a confidentiality agreement promising to never discuss their marriage publicly again. So mainstream publications pretty much stopped covering this saga because it was a non-story. Amber had photos of her injuries. There was a video of Johnny slamming cabinets and breaking glass in their kitchen. Their joint statement contained an admission that Amber didn't make up the allegations for financial gain. Even when Johnny started filing lawsuits in 2018 against The Sun and then against Amber the following year, covering the nitty-gritty details of the conflicts wasn't really a priority for major outlets. Amber's own insurance company thought her case was fairly straightforward, with Johnny's chances of winning being slim to nil. So what was there to write about? It was just like a petty celebrity squabble, or yet another legal case involving Johnny Depp. It just wasn't something that a lot of publications thought was worth investing the time and the resources into covering all that closely. But while mainstream media neglected to take up the story, the internet was becoming increasingly fixated on it. Johnny's already established online fan communities were of course primed and ready to take this case on, and so were others. Hey, wait a second. Now, contrary to what some people have tried to imply about Amber's motives, she first alleged abuse in the LA court before the Harvey Weinstein scandal, meaning she wasn't trying to capitalize on a Me Too movement that didn't yet exist. But the Me Too backlash following the Weinstein scandal of 2017 absolutely contributed to the eventually massive campaign against Amber Heard. Online men's rights activist communities were quick to latch onto any shred of evidence that Amber might be lying about the abuse. Like the men's rights subreddit with a popular post from 2019 reading, The Johnny Depp case speaks for thousands and thousands of those who actually ended up in prison for having done nothing but be part of a sexist legal system controlled by feminists. And another saying, we live in a time where even Hollywood actors face domestic abuse and the actual abuser becomes the victim because of the media bias towards women. When Johnny's lawsuit against The Sun went to trial in 2020, the men's rights organization Fathers for Justice brought a mobile billboard to the streets outside the courthouse displaying a photo of Amber and Johnny with the text, Ditch the Witch, overlaid. And while anyone of any political leaning can develop an anti-believe women's stance, much of the more mainstream push to disbelieve Amber Heard specifically came from far-right individuals and organizations. In May of last year, Vice News, alongside the nonprofit The Citizens, reported that the Ben Shapiro-founded conservative news outlet The Daily Wire had already spent tens of thousands of dollars promoting anti-Amber propaganda before the trial was over. This case has seized, not just America, has seized the entire world, and it is something that every single person should be paying attention to. Amber Heard came out, she had pictures of what appeared to be a bruise, and at that time, don't forget, Me Too was going on, so they just made her a hero. She was walking the red carpets. Every Me Too, hashtag Believe Women, hashtag Time's Up movement wanted Amber Heard at their events. Now, we all know 
how much Johnny Depp has contributed to the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. I mean, he he's worked so hard to make those movies successful. And just like that, because of hashtag Me Too, he was done. Considering that The Daily Wire was the second most popular news publisher on Facebook in the month leading up to the trial, the outlet's reach to the average American is significant. But for many of Johnny's most fervent supporters, this case didn't just represent a burgeoning war against the Me Too movement, it was also a symbol for the war against the mainstream media. And though The Daily Wire may like to advertise itself as a defiant alternative to more conventional and trusted media outlets, their success on social media alone makes them pretty mainstream. The more quietly influential batch of journalists reporting on this case were dominantly comprised of internet personalities that had absolutely tiny audiences compared to The Daily Wire. Prior to the trial starting, Johnny's then lead attorney, Adam Waldman, started leaking evidence in Johnny's favor to popular tabloids like The Daily Mail, The Blast, Page Six, and others, along with what Adam called internet journalists. And I'll define that as journalists who are not affiliated with, you mentioned, I think, NBC a moment ago or, or a, you know, a, a mainstream media outlet. Three were specifically mentioned in Waldman's questioning during the trial. One was the Twitter user The Real Laura B, who identifies herself as a researcher and truth seeker, but if you go down her Twitter page, she's just a Johnny Depp stan account. Another was the YouTuber That Umbrella Guy. In the years before he started covering the Depp v. Heard saga, That Umbrella Guy's uploads were your standard anti-SJW reactionary content. Some of his earliest videos feature him claiming that SJWs were ruining Marvel or whining about the fact that Doctor Who hired a girl. Of course, he also made a fair amount of Gamergate content, and as early as 2019 was being accused of launching harassment campaigns against those who disagreed with him. But in 2020, he started uploading videos semi-regularly on the Depp v. Heard case. By 2021, his commentary on the story was near constant as his pro-Johnny content began making up a majority of his uploads. Today, he's uploaded over 1,000 anti-Amber videos on his channel, but it's impossible to fully quantify the amount that he's contributed to this conversation, since he quickly began inspiring or directly recruiting other creators to join the fun. Like fellow YouTuber Ricada Law, who had already been accused of creating an online hate factory against alleged victims of sexual harassment and assault in 2019 as part of his fervent defense of voice actor Vic Mignogna. Clearly, outside of his advocacy for Johnny Depp, Ricada had a particular interest in defending men accused of violent and or misogynistic behavior, as did many of the other commentary channels stepping up to become Johnny's most passionate support. For instance, Andy Signore, creator of the Honest Trailers video series and its parent YouTube channel Screen Junkies, a company and channel that Signore was booted from in 2017 for alleged sexual misconduct. On October 6th, 2017, one day after Ashley Judd's New York Times article started the Me Too movement, I was literally the second person to be publicly accused of sexual misconduct. I'm angry that someone could tell such horrible lies about me, and everyone, including those who I thought were close to me, just blindly believed them. These egregious claims labeling me a sexual predator, workplace harasser, and a rapist are categorically untrue. Her relentless assault on me, labeling me a serial rapist, will forever have an effect on my children, on my parents, on my ability to secure work and support my family. Following his ousting from Screen Junkies, Andy moved to his new channel, Popcorned Planet, where he consistently publishes content in defense of men who've been accused and purportedly victimized by the Me Too movement. Today, he's made over 300 videos in support of Johnny Depp. Now, the other YouTuber Adam Waldman talked to directly is sometimes referred to as That Brian Fella, but his YouTube channel is currently called Incredibly Average. Yet again, Incredibly Average was not an unbiased party in this debate. 
His very first video uploaded in 2018 was a takedown piece for Amber's friend Io called Johnny Depp and Amber Heard Abuse Claims and the Lies Not Talked About. Then on the 31st of January 2020, Brian uploaded a selection of clips in which Amber admits to hitting Johnny with Brian's own commentary chiming in every few minutes. But this seems to be the day following the incident I covered in this video in which Amber admitted in her 2016 deposition to pushing her way into the bathroom where Johnny was hiding from her and in his attempts to keep her out, the door scraped her toes and when he leaned down to check, she kicked the door into his head and punched him in the face. A shocking amount of the audio clips recorded during Johnny and Amber's marriage that have been heard by the public come from the incredibly average channel. And I need that to sink in a little bit. One of the primary sources that a lot of the multimedia in this case comes from is from a random pro Johnny YouTube channel. And that is who Johnny Depp's attorney was leaking confidential exclusive information to two years before the trial even started. There is a tiny handful of full audio recordings from Amber and Johnny's relationship that exist online and are accessible to the public. And crucially, the audio recording where Amber is admitting to hitting Johnny isn't one of them. We know from audio transcripts in the unsealed court documents that there are sections of dialogue missing from what the public heard in those clips. And those sections aren't insignificant, as they pretty perfectly portray Amber as committing reactive violence, not domestic abuse, with Johnny being the primary instigator of physical abuse in the relationship. That's not the version that any of the public got to hear with their own ears. And most people aren't digging through unsealed documents to find the court transcripts of audio that they missed. The recordings uploaded by Incredibly Average are incomplete, either because Brian himself cut them up, or Adam Waldman just gave him incomplete files in the first place. The recording taken in the aftermath of the Australia incident, for instance, was according to the UK court about five hours long. The audio uploaded by Incredibly Average? Less than 30 minutes. Brian claims he only cut out white noise in any parts where people weren't actually talking. I've cut it down from hours of white noise, no noise, cleaning sounds, and non-speaking to get a much cleaner product, and one that I believe is much more accurate in terms of what is actually being said and what has been reported on already. But unless Waldman gave him an edited version in the first place, that's just a lie, because there are bits of dialogue transcribed in the UK court from that full recording that don't really flatter Johnny and that aren't in the clip uploaded to the incredibly average YouTube channel. Make note that during the entire audio, not only does Amber not speak as someone who just moments earlier had been physically and sexually assaulted, but these medical professionals, along with everyone else present that you'll hear, are not even acknowledging any existence of the horrifying physical injuries Amber now claims she received. A few moments later... <laughs> This kind of shit started happening online in the years leading up to the trial. The trial itself started in April of 2022, with Johnny suing Amber for $50 million claiming defamation based on three sentences published in collaboration with the ACLU for the Washington Post. In the op-ed, Amber referred to herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse and said she witnessed in real time how institutions protect men accused of abuse. Once Johnny filed, Amber then countersued for $100 million, claiming that Johnny, through public statements made by Adam Waldman, had defamed her by telling multiple publications that Amber's alleged abuse allegations were a highly coordinated hoax. By the end of this six-week civil trial, the jury had decided that both actors were right. Amber had defamed Johnny in all three contested statements from the op-ed, but Johnny had defamed her via statements given to the Daily Mail claiming that Amber and her friends staged the incident in May of 2016. 
just on that basic information alone, it's pretty obvious that something about this case was amiss. Because those separate verdicts coexisting and coming from the same jury doesn't really make any sense. If Amber and her friends didn't create this hoax related to Amber's claims of abuse from May of 2016, then Amber's version of events is true and Johnny did act abusively to her. At least on that one day. That should have been enough to say that Amber wasn't defaming Johnny by saying in 2018 in a Washington Post article that she was a public figure representing abuse. I mean, really, the fact that her abuse allegations became public in 2016 is kind of enough to prove that. Because, yeah, she was a public figure representing abuse, whether or not she was actually abused. Because let's remember, despite what a lot of people have acted like this case was about, Johnny was never suing Amber for alleging abuse. He was suing her for vaguely referencing the fact that she had alleged abuse two and a half years prior. One of the jurors later told Good Morning America that the jury actually had concluded Amber and Johnny were abusive to one another, which in itself is a concession that Amber was abused. They explained that they felt Amber's team failed to prove that her abuse had been physical. But where in the Washington Post article did she call the abuse physical? All she did was talk about the backlash she received as being a public figure who was popularly associated with abuse. And considering everything that happened after that article was published, that's pretty fucking ironic. So there were a lot of inherent problems with how this trial was carried out. As discussed in part two, it started with the fact that the case was able to move forward in Virginia in the first place. And while personally, I think the whole thing should have been dismissed just based on the wording in the op-ed alone, let's also acknowledge that of the words Amber was being sued for, she only actually wrote two of those three sentences. That line, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath, that was written by the editors of the Washington Post, which Johnny's lawyers don't dispute, by the way. And yet, Johnny wasn't suing the Washington Post, nor was he suing the ACLU, who had co-written the op-ed with Amber. In Amber's later appeal, her lawyers argued that the jury wasn't given proper instructions for establishing actual malice and that the court allowed Johnny's team to argue or imply that they could base their verdict off of damages caused by Amber's initial filing for a restraining order in 2016, rather than just the damages caused by the Washington Post article from late 2018. You know, the thing that Johnny was actually suing over? The statements given to Good Morning America alone prove Amber's point. The jury obviously didn't know what they were supposed to be ruling on if they think that her not proving physical abuse was ever relevant to the claims made in the op-ed. So already, the court allowed the scope of the case to swell far beyond the boundaries already set by the lawsuit itself. And as inappropriate as the trial setting in Fairfax, Virginia was, outside influence on this case knew no jurisdiction whatsoever. It was Johnny's team that pressed to have the trial televised via two pool cameras operated by the digital broadcast network Court TV, which live streamed the trial alongside the YouTube channel Law & Crime. It's not the first time a high-profile case like this has been filmed and televised, of course. Back when Court TV had an actual cable TV channel, they broadcast the O.J. Simpson trial, the case against the Menendez brothers, and more. But this digital broadcast of Depp v. Heard was unique. Firstly, because of the landscapes of cable TV versus the internet are vastly different. You don't just watch stuff that happens online the way that you watch something that happens in a traditional TV format. Online content invites participation. In live chats on the original broadcasts. In live chats on commentary or reaction streams. Or just in the creation of commentary or reaction content itself. A genre of entertainment that is pretty democratized. In 1995, if you wanted your thoughts on the O.J. Simpson case to be heard by a massive audience, 
you'd have to find a way to get on TV to offer that commentary. In 2022, you didn't even need to put your face out there. You could get millions of views from a tweet or easily create your own edits from the trial just by screen recording the live streams. There have, of course, been other high-profile cases of immense cultural relevance broadcast for mass viewership, but I don't think that most people who watched the spectacle of Depp v. Heard unfold have really been able to recognize the degree to which something of this scale has never happened before. We take for granted the fact that the internet and social media are very, very new technologies in the entire history of human networked communication. To the point that we really haven't had time to process what any of this means for how our society operates and how we interact with one another. Just in the last few years alone, we've seen countless news stories of average everyday citizens taking online sleuthing too far. Like in late 2021, when a seemingly innocent TikTok of a girl surprising her long-distance boyfriend became the source of an internet-wide investigation to decide whether or not Couch Guy was cheating on his girlfriend. There is no amount of uplifting, inspiring music that can mask what we're all seeing happen here. I know the general consensus is that the boyfriend is shady and doing something behind her back and the three other girls are in on it and no. But someone just posted a fan theory, a headcanon, that what if there's a reason they don't like her? What if she's a problematic one? It would be so fascinating, a great plot twist if she was the villain and this is like the dark timeline. The person I want to address the most though is his best friend. You know which guy that is, right? This guy. From your attitude in this video alone, I can tell you're the type of guy to give a friend an alibi. There's also a hair tie on his wrist that appear that people are theorizing is the other girls. But hold on, we didn't finish analyzing the phone. Here he leans forward. Where does the phone come from? Where does the phone come from? Okay. So now he's kind of hunching down, he's closing in, he still has his arm across. He hasn't really opened up to her. I'm not getting excitement from him. When you told me, Sonny, you made it sound like he was like wrapped around all these women. Well, but he didn't look He's that perched. excited. He was like, Hi. well, he was shocked. His head dropped like this. He went like. Yes, maybe he could have been more excited, but in his defense, you have to remember these are COVID times and she just got off a plane. So even if he's really happy to see her, he's probably thinking, is it okay to hug her? Was she tested? Is she gonna give COVID to my side chick? We have created a culture where everyone feels like they can be an equal participant in an ongoing news story. Not just as commentators, but contributors to an actual investigation. No matter if we're investigating something as silly as a college-age kid who may or may not have someone's ponytail holder on his wrist, or something incredibly serious, like a stranger's death or a Hollywood couple's apparently abusive relationship. And unlike in the O.J. Simpson and Menendez brothers' trials, the jurors of Depp v. Heard were not sequestered. Every day they left the courtroom with instructions to not do any outside research or discuss the trial with anyone, but unless that jury completely abstained from checking social media and still somehow managed to stop everyone in their life from mentioning the case to them, they were vulnerable to outside influence because this topic was 100% unavoidable online from April until June of last year, and not in an even-handed way. Pro Johnny commentary was the dominant perspective everywhere you looked online. If the jurors opened TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc., they were exposed to anti-Amber rhetoric, including misinformation and overwhelming discourse on how authentic her displays of emotion appeared. Not sequestering the jury was a decision made by the court that of course benefited the party who always had a bigger and louder army of support than their opposition. Evidence of which jurors already witnessed walking into the courthouse, where crowds of Johnny Depp stands and their alpacas congregated outside throughout the trial. And the cases each side was able to present inside the courtroom were also pretty biased in one party's favor. 
During pre-trial motions, the court wouldn't allow Johnny to bring nude photographs of Amber into evidence. Thank God. But that also seems to be one of the very, very few pieces of evidence submitted by Johnny's team to be denied inclusion into his final exhibits. While much of Amber's evidence was dismissed before her team ever got the chance to present it. Evidence like notes from three separate therapists treating Amber, even though one of those therapists was a couple's counselor who treated Amber and Johnny. That's an incredibly suspect exclusion. Cause while Dr. Laurel Anderson was able to testify to her belief in court that Amber and Johnny had a mutually abusive relationship, the couple's first marriage counselor, Dr. Amy Banks, stated in a deposition from February of 2022 that she believed Johnny had initiated the violence in the relationship, saying, quote, What I can tell you without a doubt is that Amber Heard told me that Johnny Depp was involved with violence with her when he was using substances particularly and that she would fight back. And those statements were made also in front of Mr. Depp without anybody contradicting them." Unquote. None of Dr. Banks' testimony was heard by the jury, nor were the words of either of the personal therapists that Amber had been seeing during the relationship, despite both of them submitting notes to the court from their sessions. Dr. Jacobs was even on Amber's initial witness list. She was never called to the stand because the court decided that anything Amber told her in those sessions was hearsay. Now, people act like hearsay is this super strict, specific restriction put on every court case. But in any case like this, courts are able to make exceptions to the hearsay rule. And a lot of courts do make exceptions for things like therapy notes, or just other versions of contemporaneous reportings that support a defendant's position. If Johnny was accusing Amber of defaming him with this one Washington Post article, it's absolutely relevant to Amber's defense that she'd been making the exact same allegations privately to therapists, to medical professionals, and to other people in her life years before she ever wrote this op-ed. And if Amber actually did just lie to Dr. Jacobs every time she spoke of her relationship starting all the way back in 2011, wouldn't that also be relevant to Johnny's claims that Amber had this years-long smear campaign against him? Same thing for all the text messages that Amber sent loved ones during that time that were also dismissed as hearsay. Dr. Luke once successfully sued Kesha for defamation over a private text message that she sent to Lady Gaga. And for years, Amber was privately texting multiple people in her life to tell them that Johnny Depp was abusing her. It just kind of seems like if Amber had been making all this stuff up about Johnny as early as 2011, he would have bigger things to be upset about than a Washington Post article. Now, if you watched the trial, you might have noticed that Amber and Johnny both hired dueling psychologists to evaluate the mental state of one another, but that only Johnny's forensic psychologist actually got to meet with the person they were evaluating. There's a reason for that. Johnny's attorneys argued, quote, Mr. Depp does not allege a specific cause of action for intentional or negligent infliction of emotional distress, does not assert that Ms. Heard's actions caused him a specific psychiatric injury, and does not claim that Ms. Heard's actions caused him to experience unusually severe emotional distress. So because Amber claimed to have PTSD from the relationship, while Johnny never officially claimed to suffer unusually severe emotional distress, except for the fact that he kinda did throughout his whole testimony, but Amber was made to undergo a psychiatric evaluation while Johnny was not. Now, when Amber's team learned that those were the rules they had to play by, they probably shouldn't have put their expert witness up on the stand at all. Dr. Spiegel stating that Johnny seemed to have narcissistic personality traits without ever actually meeting with him was a bad look, and it opened the door for Johnny's team to hire another psychologist to testify that Dr. Spiegel had broken the Goldwater Rule. My opinion is that he violated the ethical principles that are outlined in the Goldwater Rule when he gave his opinions about um, Mr. Depp, specifically with relationship to personality traits and his cognitive abilities. Um, my second 
primary opinion would be that the Dr. Spiegel's opinions、um, were unreliable. In general, though, forensic psychology is also just not a super reliable science, especially in an instance like Depp v. Heard, where each side is trying to make the other look emotionally unstable. The forensic psychologists that serve as expert witnesses for either side are going to be incredibly vulnerable to a bias that favors their client. The person literally paying them to testify, and the potential bias for Johnny's expert witness especially was significant. For one thing, Dr. Curry is best friends with Camille Vasquez, Johnny's lead attorney in Fairfax, to the point that Dr. Curry publicly refers to Camille as "love bug" on social media. Filings from Johnny's attorneys in February of 2021 also state that Dr. Curry was expected to testify that Amber exhibited patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring Cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder. But Dr. Curry didn't evaluate Amber until December of 2021. So is it just a coincidence that Dr. Curry came to the exact same conclusion that Johnny's lawyers had already outlined for her ten months prior? And while it is true that Dr. Curry does specialize in treating PTSD, in her normal practice she specifically focuses on treating patients with PTSD from military service. If they have multiple different similar types of events, like seeing combat, then you might. Use that as the worst one, the multiple similar. So you describe an anchor, we call it, to do the testing, and we would maybe describe the anchor as the worst of my combat experience. Okay. Now, if somebody had multiple different traumas from different times in their life, like childhood abuse, and then went to combat and had some horrible things happen there, arguably not the best person to decide whether or not Amber Heard had trauma from an intimate relationship. Even without all that background info on Dr. Curry, the fact that she diagnosed Amber with borderline personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder after 12 hours of meeting with her in thoroughly unnatural circumstances should raise alarm bells for anyone with even passing knowledge of those disorders. Some experts have argued that histrionic personality disorder isn't even a real thing, but rather an outdated, often sexist label. Historically used to undermine the credibility of women who show any ounce of emotion. If you accept that HPD is a legitimate diagnosis, borderline and histrionic are still incredibly complex personality disorders, which most therapists won't diagnose until after weeks, months, or even years of regular sessions with their patients. While Dr. Curry diagnosed Amber after 12 hours, while being paid by Amber's ex-husband, whose lead attorney is a close friend of hers, and whose team had already made documented claims. Claims about what she was expected to say. And for the record, the therapist that Amber was seeing from 2011 to 2016 on a regular basis never once diagnosed her with a personality disorder in the years of therapy notes that the court received and the jury never saw. What struck me was Ms. Raquel Pennington's testimony.、Um, she's a former friend of Ms. Hurd's and. She indicated. She told a story about. I suppose they were shopping for Thanksgiving accoutrements, something to prepare for Thanksgiving. We were setting up for Thanksgiving. We were looking for maybe some glasses or some dishware. We had just moved in, and we couldn't find them anywhere. And then、um, she finally found them in a place that I thought I had looked, and we started arguing about that. And Ms. Hurd. Struck her in the face, sort of out of the blue.、Um, was this just a verbal altercation, or did you get physical with each other? Yeah, I believe that we, I believe that I pushed her. How did Miss Amber Heard react to that? She either pushed or hit me back. And Miss Heard struck her in the face, sort of out of the blue. I believe that I pushed her. That is one of those. Signs of borderline personality disorder, where if a if a friend or a loved one isn't meeting your needs in that moment, I know it might make people sound informed on this case to say that they know Amber was lying because they watched all 
200 or whatever hours of this trial, but trials should never be used as a primary source. The information presented to a jury is an inherently limited set of data. And often what matters more is in how that data is presented and how skilled each side is at manipulating the evidence to their advantage. Dr. Curry's testimony when put into its proper context is like offensively ridiculous. For a lot of people though, it was still really compelling because Dr. Curry is a good public speaker. She performed well, and that's really all she was ever tasked to do. It's not difficult to note the similarities between Depp v. Heard and The People vs. O.J. Simpson. Both trials centered around a case in which a widely beloved male celebrity was accused of grotesque violence against an ex-wife. Both trials were also televised, and in both trials, the allegedly abusive ex-husband pretty much won despite the overwhelming evidence pointing to his guilt. Evidence, by the way, that included diary entries from the allegedly abused wives detailing the assaults, which in both cases were dismissed as hearsay, and evidence that successfully convinced other courts in trials that, probably not coincidentally, weren't televised and used as entertainment. Depp v. Heard is kinda like the People vs. O.J. Simpson if Nicole Brown actually survived the attack, pointed exactly to the person that tried to kill her, but then everybody just decided that she seemed like a huge bitch anyway, so who really cares? In OJ's case, there was straight up blood evidence linking him to the murders, but it didn't matter. The verdict was not guilty because OJ's lawyers knew what it actually takes to win a case. Theatrics. It's no disguise. It makes no sense. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And who acted as Camille Vasquez's mentor, but the man who helped O.J. Simpson get away with literal murder? I grew up watching, I did watch when I was in sixth grade, the um, O.J. Simpson trial. And I had the pleasure of working for Robert Shapiro when I was a law student. And we established a relationship and um, throughout the years. And then when I was in law school, he offered me an internship. So he was a trial lawyer that I obviously admired. I mean, right. they were called the dream team. Then it was the first public televised trial that I can recall other than obviously many years later, the Johnny Depp yeah. trial that was televised. Um, so I think Robert Shapiro was one of my mentors and I was really lucky that I got to work with him. From like a moral perspective, Camille Vasquez is not someone that I really have much respect for. I think she's a pretty shitty person, but I can't deny that she is a good trial attorney. And she, along with Johnny's other legal representatives, made a lot of very good, very calculated decisions. One of the things each side in a dispute like this needs to think about is what's the worst impression a jury can get of our client and how do we counteract that? For Johnny, obviously the fact that this case revolves around accusations of physical abuse against a woman means one of the worst things a jury might think of him is that he's a violent misogynist. Thus, it helps that his most aggressive attorney, especially during Amber Heard's cross-examination, was a woman. And the first witness called in the entire trial was Johnny's sister. Meaning the defense of Johnny Depp was being led by the exact demographic that Amber was trying to prove he doesn't respect. Are you aware of any occasion on which any woman other than Miss Heard has ever accused your brother of any type of physical abuse? Objection, foundation, hearsay. No, I'll allow the answer. No. Johnny's team won on the counts that they did by appealing to human beings' natural cognitive biases and logical fallacies. One of those biases is called the halo effect, which describes the tendency of people to oversimplify human behavior, instinctively believing that someone who does good things is necessarily a good person and not capable of doing anything that we as a society traditionally associate with bad people. Alongside the idea that Johnny is a violent misogynist, if he was in fact abusive to Amber, that would make him an abuser, a type of person that we generally don't think are very good. 
So Johnny's team needed to quickly establish that Johnny is in fact a good or even great person. Everyone but Amber Heard loves him. He was he was a a, a shy, sweet little boy. He had a very caring personality. Um, Did you ever witness Mr. Depp be rude to anyone? He's such a gentleman. He's so uh, he's like a total southern gentleman. So, uh... Mr. Depp was always a gentleman and and keen to make sure Miss Heard was taken care of. Anything she needed, often pour a glass of wine for her. Johnny was always very nice, sweet. In fact, um, you know, artistic, polite, and you know, very thoughtful. You know, kind of uniquely thoughtful about how are you doing? How's your family? You know, he was he was he was just a thoughtful person. He always has been. I know that Stephen um, really respects Johnny and looks up to him. And Johnny's been a, a mentor to him um, and has really encouraged Stephen's career. During the course of time that you were living at the Eastern Columbia building, um, did Mr. Depp ever give you any money? Yeah. How much did he give you? Over a period of four years of the patronship, I, ca I ballpark it calculated probably around 100000 And did you have an opportunity to observe Mr. Depp's interactions with uh, Ms. Hurd's family and friends? I did. And how would you generally describe their interactions? Um, he was very open and warm to them. He, you know, offered them, you know, uh, whatever they needed. They were constantly coming around the estate. Um, you know, eventually he let a couple of them live in his penthouses downtown for free. He would let them, a few of them drive his nice, um, Dodge Challenger in and around town and take on trips. What was your understanding of whether Mr. Depp intended to be paid back for the oh. money that he provided to you? There's no, it's, he, that's not even the thought of being paid back. He's one of the most devoted fathers I think that I've ever seen. Like everything, uh, everything in life was about the children. But when he was with the kids, like the attention that he would give them, you know, it was just constant playing with them, listening to them, you know, laughing with them, reading to them, Barbies, I mean, you, you name it. And he... He was there. How, would you please describe for the jury very briefly Mr. Depp's interactions with his children, Jack and Lily Rose? He was a very loving father. He, he used to do stuff with the, the kids all the time, going swimming at the island and teaching them scuba diving and, you know, just drawing, a lot of drawing, doing artwork. Did Mr. Depp ever interact with your son? Yes, he was very kind. Can you give me an estimate of how often that happened? Oh, countless times. Uh, he would he would even teach him how to play guitar. He brought him back from vacations. Uh, he showed him his amazing makeup makeover when he was uh, doing black mass. He tricked him. He leant over and was saying, "Do you know who I am?" And, like the full makeup on his son's jaw almost hit the ground. It was really cute, actually. The fact that Johnny Depp is a celebrity is an advantage to him in a lot of ways. Most Americans have a slight parasocial relationship with him, even if they're not specifically Johnny stands, especially considering the fact that he's been working in mainstream entertainment since the 80s. When I was a kid, advertisements for Pirates of the Caribbean would play on the Disney Channel. Can you guys give me your best pirate impersonation? Arrgh, matey. I'm going to steal all of your booty. So plenty of people already have positive associations with Johnny's public persona. That's a benefit to him for the most part. But that could be a detriment if the jury decided that he was an entitled diva or unrelatable in any way. Especially since a lot of Amber's claims were going to involve the alleged yes-men that surround him and the influence his celebrity has on others. Thus, the first two people that we hear from in the trial are the two people in the entire thing that knew Johnny before he was famous. And quite a lot of their testimony had nothing to do with Johnny's relationship with Amber, it was just about how great of a guy Johnny is. Then a lot of Christie's testimony ended up being about the alleged victimization of Johnny Depp at the hands of their mother, Betty Sue. When Johnny eventually took the stand for the first time on day five, this became an even larger point of focus, particularly as Johnny spoke about the alleged passivity of his father. My father, my father was a very 
kind man. Uh, in fact, my father's still alive. He's he's a very kind man. And when Betty Sue, my mother, would go off on 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 a tangent uh, toward my my father, he, he amazingly remained very very stoic. He stood there and just looked at her while she delivered the pain. He he, he remained a gentleman. He was able to maintain <clears throat> his calm and his composure. He was able to maintain uh, his relationship with his children. He was, uh, he was, he was a good man. Uh, he is a good man. And already, I kinda gotta call bullshit. Not on the claim that Johnny's mother was abusive, I'm sure she was, and I'm sure it did affect Johnny a lot growing up, but the glorification of Johnny's father seems like a bit of a historical revision. For one thing, Johnny insists that his father remained actively involved in the children's lives after leaving Johnny's mother. But that's definitely not what the public narrative of Johnny Depp's life was prior to the trial. Since the 90s at least, the story has been that Johnny's dad essentially abandoned the family when Johnny was 15. It reportedly took years for them to re-establish a relationship, and the most Johnny saw his father for a while was when he was sent to his office to pick up child support checks. The image that Johnny painted at Fairfax was that his mother was THE abuser in the household. Everyone else, including Johnny's father, was at Betty Sue's mercy. But Johnny told Talk Magazine in 1993 that when his parents split, he was relieved, saying, I thought that every household had this intensity, this violence, this harshness. It was rough for all the kids. We grew up every day with the sense that something was about to blow. So in a way, when my parents split up, it was, yeah, a relief. But Johnny lived with his mother after the split. If his dad and all the kids were just at Betty Sue's mercy, why would the non-violent parent leaving cause him to feel relieved? In the very first therapy session of Amber Heard's that we have notes from, from October of 2011, Dr. Jacobs made record of Amber's developing relationship with Johnny, writing, Feel sorry for him because his father was also an abusive alcoholic, has scars from beatings, dad used belts and chains, also burnt him with cigarettes, scars all over body, including head. Then in October of 2012, Dr. Jacobs wrote that both of Johnny's parents were abusive, but his father was worse. Now, of course, those are just Amber's therapy notes. They are hearsay, like legitimate hearsay. I wouldn't submit that as evidence into a court of law, but just thinking rationally, what reason would Amber have to lie about Johnny's relationship with his father in 2011 and 2012? And where would she have gotten that information about Johnny's childhood if not from Johnny himself or maybe his sister Christy. I think it's pretty likely that Johnny's dad wasn't the angel he was implied to be at Fairfax. And you you testified that your dad wasn't abusive, but that you saw him punch walls when he was in an argument with your mother sometimes, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, I, I witnessed my father, the, the only... Um, reaction that would be called a physical reaction from uh, the abuse he was uh, very stoically taking uh, from my mother. Um, I saw him maybe twice, three times, uh, punch a wall once, as I said, once he punched the corner of the wall and I watched his hand, uh, hands of hand, basically shatter. Right. Mr. Depp, your walls weren't the only thing that your father punched, were they? In fact, once he, he punched you in the face and knocked you down, didn't he? Um, he, yes, when I was um, 15. And that's fine, whatever. Let's just go ahead and assume that Johnny's father was the unquestionably good man that 2022 Johnny said that he was. What does that have to do with a Washington Post article? Obviously, nothing. 
Johnny and his father can be a victim of his mother's abuse, and that doesn't mean that Amber isn't a public figure representing abuse. It doesn't even mean that Amber wasn't abused by Johnny. But Johnny's team was trying to craft an engaging story, complete with thematic parallels, a likable protagonist, and an archetypal villain. And since this case was becoming so politicized, with one side of the divide holding up this idea that Johnny Depp is a representative of male victims of domestic violence, specifically domestic violence perpetrated by a female partner, it makes sense to portray him as a consistent victim to a woman's instability. First Betty Sue, then Amber Heard. The conclusion that Johnny's team ultimately wanted the jury to accept wasn't that Amber Heard defamed Johnny, they just wanted the jury and all the other people watching to think, Johnny Depp good, Amber Heard bad. I was kind of excited to meet Amber, you know, because she was Johnny's new girl and, um, but I remember kind of trying to, you know, kind of make eye contact and I kind of felt a bit ignored. Some of the primary characteristics, and I'm going to try to condense 25 pages here, were essentially um, externalization of blame, uh, tending to have a lot of inner hostility that is attempted to be controlled, um, a tendency to be very self-righteous, but to also deny that self-righteousness and to judge others. How would you describe Miss Hurd's tone when she said, um, why did you take your hand away, Johnny? Accusatory, spoiled teenage child. Well, she was giving Johnny the cold shoulder, being quiet, um, and, uh, you know, seemed pouty. Let's, so when you asked her if she was okay, you didn't actually care if she was okay. You said you were just placating her, right? It was a standard, standard procedure at this point. She was a very dramatic person. Ms. Hurd did not have PTSD, and there were also pretty significant indications that she was grossly exaggerating symptoms of PTSD when asked about them. She would write things quite often or explain things quite often and, and uh, it's a bit more dramatic maybe than what we understood it to be or, or um, maybe even sometimes the instances were different than what she was describing. So when you say she went absolutely ballistic over that, can you please describe what you mean? Screaming, yelling, abuse, blind, rage. But she basically demeaned my career choice, called me a fucking yes man. What, if anything, did you hear Ms. Hurd say about Mr. Depp's physical appearance? She called him an old fat man. She told me she didn't like hanging out in his house with his friends because it it was boring and they were all old men playing guitars and it wasn't interesting to her. She was sitting next to me in the vehicle. Um, she was talking to a girlfriend or a friend where they were talking about another male. And she says to the friend, girlfriend, whoever she was talking to, you know, all men are idiots, you know, you shouldn't trust that guy. And then she turned to me and she said, you know, sorry, Sean, not you. I didn't mean that. And I just shrugged it off like it's not a big deal. To the point that one of the primary pieces of evidence against Amber is the allegation that she lied about donating the money from her divorce settlement to the ACLU and a children's hospital. She didn't, by the way. The most you could say was that she was kind of deceptive with her language because she at first said that she donated the money when what she really should have said was that she pledged to donate the money. Which became this huge point of contention in the trial with Camille Vasquez trying to make it seem like that distinction really makes that much of a difference. So in this October 2018 interview, you said that you had, quote, donated, end quote, your entire divorce settlement to charity, right? That's correct. And in fact, your exact words were, quote, seven million in total was donated to, I split it between the ACLU and the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, end quote, That's right? That's correct. I made that statement as soon as I got a divorce and we reached the settlement. That's when I pledged it, right then. Sitting here today, Ms. Hurd, you still haven't donated the $7 million divorce settlement to charity. Isn't that right? Incorrect. I pledged the entirety no, of Ms. the Hurd, settlement, $7 that, million to question. charity, and I, I Hurd, intend to Ms. fulfill Hurd, those obligations. Hurd, that's not my question. Please, what try was your to question? answer my question. 
sitting here today, you have not donated the $7 million donated, not pledged, donated the $7 million divorce settlement to charity. I use pledge and donation synonymous with one another. They, but I don't. Miss Heard, I don't use it synonymously. That's how donations are paid. Miss Heard, respectfully, that's not my question. You testified under oath that, quote, the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote, didn't you? That's correct. I pledged the entirety. No. Ms. Heard, my questions. Your counsel will have time to redirect you after. You testified under oath, quote, the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote. That is correct. I pledged the entirety. I'm going to move to strike everything after yes. Uh, all right. No. no. Ms. Hurt, this I, is it, really no. inappropriate. I, I'll sustain the objection and we'll just move forward. Thank you. Let's move forward. Next Thank question. You. Under oath, that statement wasn't true, was it, Ms. Hurd? I'm sorry, I don't follow your question. Sorry. You testified under oath, quote, the entirety of my divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote. That statement wasn't true. It is true. I pledged the entirety to charity. The statement. When you say you buy a house, you don't pay Ms. for Heard, the entire house Heard, at one time. You pay it I'm over not asking, time. Ms. Heard. All right, next question, please. Thank you. That statement isn't true today, as you sit here today, is it? It is true. I pledged the entirety. But you didn't charity. donate it. Unfortunately. You didn't donate it. It's a yes or no. I haven't been able to obligate, I mean, to fulfill those So that's a no, right, Ms. Heard? I, am, I made the pledge. I want to be very clear. I pledged the entirety. I haven't been able to fulfill those pledges because I've been sued. You had all of the $7 million for 13 months before Mr. Depp sued you and you chose not to pay it to the charities you pledged it to. Is that I, correct? Ms. I Hart? disagree with your characterization of that. The fact is, we literally have pieces of correspondence between Amber and the charities involved, where it's clearly stated, this check represents the first of multiple scheduled installments to honor the full amount of Miss Heard's $3,500,000 pledged gift. It was always the plan for Amber to pay that money over multiple years via installments. And she did do that at first. She was named on the ACLU's annual lists of donors in 2017 and 2018. And what happened after that? She got fucking sued. She got roped into the lawsuit in the UK in 2018 and then was sued herself for $50 million in Virginia in 2019. So she put the payments on pause, fully intending to resume them when she could. And she did communicate that to the charities involved. Once Ms. Heard began having financial difficulties, um, we obviously recognized that that might um, impact whether the full 3.5 million is paid or impact whether it's paid over a much longer period of time. None of this matters, but by hammering the point that Amber lied about donating to charity, especially when one of those charities is a children's hospital, it makes her look like a shitty person. And just as Johnny's team used the halo effect to make him look like a great person who could never hit someone he loved, they used the inverse horn effect to make Amber look like a villain in every aspect of her life, attacking her ability to retain friendships. You may have noticed that no one showed up for Ms. Hurd in this courtroom other than her sister. This is a woman who burns bridges. Her close friends don't show up for her. Implying she used her relationship with Johnny to get jobs. Mr. Depp got you that role in Aquaman, didn't he? Excuse me? Mr. Depp got you that role in Aquaman, didn't he? and having people give testimonies that imply she's kind of a bitch. Well, at one point I went up to her and said uh, something to the effect of, you know, he cares about you. And all of a sudden she snapped and started yelling at me. How dare you talk to me? Get away from me. Keep in mind, by the way, that that man was testifying about a day that Amber alleges Johnny kicked her in front of his friends and staff. And if someone came up to me after that and said, you know he cares about you? 
how dare you talk to me is the nicest thing that I would say to them. More importantly though, that witness was one of 26 for Johnny, plus Johnny himself called to the stand before Amber Heard could testify or call any of her own witnesses to corroborate her side. Along with the halo effect, human beings are prone to anchor biases. We tend to cling to the first pieces of information that we receive on a topic and then disregard any conflicting evidence brought to our attention afterward. Over and over again, Johnny's team told their audience exactly the things that could make him look like an innocent victim to Amber's abusive, borderline histrionic personality. And it's worth mentioning that of those 26 witnesses that Johnny's team called in the first act of this play, 22 of them either have been or were being financially benefited from their relationship with him. In fact, in the entire trial, about two thirds of the witnesses have some sort of financial tie to Johnny, either past or present, including some of Amber's witnesses, like her friends who previously lived rent free in Johnny's homes. Most of the people that audiences of this trial heard from had some kind of incentive to testify the way that Johnny Depp wanted them to, including an especially his sister Christy, who's also his longtime manager and allegedly has been treating his bank account like her own for years. Because Johnny's team needed to minimize any concerns that jurors might have over Johnny's character before Amber had the chance to levy any claims against him, one of the major claims that they needed to get ahead of was that Johnny Depp struggles with substance abuse. As much as they could and did rewrite the public narrative of Johnny Depp in certain areas, given the number of reports about his drug and alcohol use over the course of his entire career, they couldn't get away with completely denying that he had a problem, but they still managed to downplay the issue in two primary ways. One, they just blamed Amber. The constant haranguing breaks you down. You know, there's a part of you that says, listen, if I'm going to be accused of this, might as well just do it. But it, it, it never, m my substance abuse or use, the alcohol that I uh, used or drank uh, w was purely, it, it's, it's that little boy who didn't want to hear or didn't want to feel the pain of his uh, mother turning him into some kind of ball of insecurity and pain. So yes, I was more inspired by Miss Heard to reach out for a numbing agent. And then two, they made it seem like Amber had just exaggerated Johnny's drug use and that it wasn't ever really that bad. And that's where Christy comes in. She would write things quite often or explain things quite often and, and uh, it's a bit more dramatic maybe than what we understood it to be or, or um, maybe even sometimes the instances were different than what she was describing. So, Did you ever have reason to believe from anyone other than Amber that Mr. Depp had a problem with drugs or alcohol? No. Did you ever have reason to believe from someone other than Amber that Mr. Depp romanticized drug culture? No. Did you ever have reason to believe from anyone other than Amber that Mr. Depp didn't take accountability for his actions? I didn't have reason to believe that, no. But Christie's claim that Amber was the only person telling her that Johnny had a problem is just a bold-faced lie. For one thing, there are text messages between Christy and Steven Duders, Johnny's assistant, from right after the Australia incidents of 2015, where Steven writes, Kipper is now talking to JD, hoping to get through to him and explain to him that this period needs to end now before we get into real trouble. Then later that same day, well, conversations seem to be going well. JD is agreeing to all that Kipper is requesting he do in order to turn himself around. Of course, we've heard that before, so we'll see. Prior to that, in August of 2014, Dr. Kipper emailed Christy and said of Johnny, he is uncomfortable, is pessimistic that he will ever be able to stop doing drugs, actually romanticizes the entire drug culture, and has no accountability for his behaviors. 
When we discussed soliciting support from those in the sobriety community that he respected, he gave what seemed to be lip service, referencing these folks more for their celebrity than their struggle with sobriety and what they could bring to his table. There is also an issue of patience. He is driven almost reflexively by his id. He has no patience for not getting his needs met, has no understanding of delayed gratification, and is quite childlike in his reactions when he does not get immediate satisfaction. Action. So, yeah. Amber was definitely not the only person telling Christy that Johnny had a problem. She was well aware, and according to Amber's therapy notes, also helping Johnny gain access to drugs. But Johnny's team was very deliberate in how they rolled their claims out, in the order of the witnesses called, in how they questioned the witnesses, even in the ways that they dressed. And so it's about maintaining control in cross-examination. Right, in comparison to direct examination, if you look at the job that my colleague and partner Jessica Myers did of Johnny Depp, we wanted all the attention to be on him. You barely saw her, you heard her very briefly, you know, just small little questions, um, and then it was just on him. <clears throat> we wanted the jury to be captivated by him and for him to tell his story. She, everything from even what she wore, she put her hair back, she yeah. her very muted color, um, that mattered because we didn't want anything taking away attention from him. Yet when I did the cross-examination, I wore all white. I wanted people mm. to be looking at me. I didn't want them looking at Miss Hurt. Amber's team, on the other hand, not as calculated. You didn't know what could cause damage to Mr. Depp's hand while you were there on March 8th, correct? Dr. Kipper told me he sustained an injury on uh, one of his well, fingers. Uh, rejection, Here's, hearsay. Wait, you, you asked the question. Okay. Oh. Next question. Okay. <laughs> the funny thing is, the most cringe moments from Amber's attorneys have been used against Amber like it's something that she did. Like, the reason Amber had worse representation than Johnny was that she's just a worse person and not, you know, a poorer person. And to be clear, I don't blame Elaine or any of Amber's other lawyers. They were small-time employment discrimination attorneys from a local Virginia firm working for a woman with a reported net worth of $500,000 and going against a multi-millionaire movie star and his attorneys from a major international firm in a court that was already fucking them to an unreasonable degree. But yeah, they made some huge mistakes. I mean, clearly from the unsealed documents, the court did have access to the longer audio recording where Amber said she hit Johnny. So why didn't they play the other sections of that recording where Amber literally explains that she became reflexively violent because of the violence that Johnny had already initiated in the relationship? I think that would have been a really helpful thing for audiences and the jury to hear. And then in the trial itself, there were so many moments where it feels like Amber's team should have been objecting to more things. Like, why didn't they object when Johnny said, It was a photograph of the bed, our bed, and on my side of the bed was human fecal matter. That fecal matter in question was never tested. Or if it was because Johnny did tell Amber that he was going to get it tested, his attorneys never shared the results. Amber said that it was the dog shit, so we have no evidence that it was ever human. Why would you just let him say that on the stand and not object to it? And Elaine, as nice of a lady as she seems, just doesn't have the public speaking skills that Camille Vasquez has. Just in the comparative opening statements for this case, Johnny's team was burying Amber's. I mean, Elaine just went like on and on and on. And they show bruises and they show cut lips. They show hair pulled out of her hair. They pull, they show all kinds of, they show two black eyes when he head butted her. Those are all going to be there. We also are going to show you a video and I'll talk about the time frame of it. Ms. Hurd took that on her iPad, um, and it was one day when she was in 
the, 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 the kitchen with Mr. Being abusive to her and he's slamming the kitchen cupboards and their glass and you can hear them rattling and you can hear them breaking. Then he goes over with a big glass of wine and he has a huge bottle of wine and he pours oh, more in glass. There. And then she the says the liquor and the urine and the blood stains and everything else in that house. And you can hear Johnny his handlers. It's one who is always, uh, always, well, I can't say always because he has the courage and courage. He's like a Madison. demon that he views his, his wife, Amber, like his mother and his sister that he hates. Yeah. You're going to um, see a list of his prescription drugs that his concierge doctor and the abuse. Who charged him up. Amber rode horses with her father. She tried to work with anything that she could get. Break the horses. And she, she would go on, but she didn't have a vehicle. So and she, she would, would just go around. She had a big sweater so, so she could change underneath. And she remembers her face was in this dirty, filthy carpet. That's what she, she remembers in fixing it. And she sat in the car for the longest time. And she remembers watching her breath in a minute. Because she comes time. out. He's got mashed potatoes spread across the top. He's got, and it's it's just an end. Then he's urinating. Okay, tried to urinate. She, this is a month after they are, just got married. She, she flew in. One time it was for three days. And one one time it was for five days. Who loved that Johnny. And unfortunately, her father used to drink and do drugs with I'll Johnny. I'll be there after that. Uh, yeah. What kind of business meeting do you need to have at 7 p.m. when your yeah. wife turns When 30. she, on her birthday, go back to her birthday, the next day she... And, and, and I was thinking, what? Now, I was and, and very, very upset. Fine. He's worried because he knows about the December 15 leaves. He loves to do that. You're going to hear about his pension for that. Does it a lot about this. Um, You'll hear from many, actually, I don't know how many of the police officers will put on their stack. It, it, you know, it, if it all of that was true. And, and you're, they so they knew. And it says right in there, uh, she's going to go in though. That's that's the testimony on that. Like, even as someone who believes Amber and is obviously at this point very invested in this case, when I was going back to watch clips from this trial, I watched Elaine's opening on double speed and still just wanted her to, like, shut up. And while Johnny's team had been setting up this narrative of him being a representation of male domestic abuse victims, even though, remember, Johnny isn't alleging any specific emotional distress. The first witness Amber's team called to the stand during week four of this mess was an expert in traumatic stress and intimate partner violence who, though she did say both men and women can be victims of domestic violence, throughout her testimony she also continuously used gendered language when talking about the dynamics of abuse. When violence has already been established in the relationship, the victim often feels that she can't say no for fear of reprisal, for fear of retaliation. And what that does, it again erodes the victim's autonomy and it erodes her sense of privacy. She doesn't feel that wherever she can go, that somewhere he's not going to be um, part of her life in, an, in a very objectionable way. You know, that can rise the fear level in, in a victim that she may modify her behavior quicker and he might not need to use physical violence because he's already established that that fear is there. So it makes it very difficult for the victim of the abuse to sort of extricate herself from that relationship and for her to even believe, frankly, I mean, that takes a lot of time to even believe that she can. Now that is in a lot of ways understandable. It's absolutely true that anyone of any gender can be a victim of domestic abuse, whether physical or emotional. But on the whole, and specifically from a sociological perspective, domestic violence is largely a gendered issue that primarily victimizes women. Using occasionally gendered language when talking about the average abuse case, which Amber Heard is more or less a representation of, is understandable understandable and not wholly inappropriate, but with how Johnny's team and so many commentators on this situation were spinning this case into some sort of what about men rhetoric, this was without a doubt the wrong move. It just plays into the perception of this case that the only reason anyone believes Amber Heard is because she's a woman. Then the second witness called to the stand for Amber's side was Amber Heard. 
The person the jury had been told for a bit over three weeks was an overdramatic, lying phony. To deal with the most damning allegations that could be levied at Johnny and proven to be undoubtedly true, like his drug use, his team got ahead of the claims by embracing them. He did drugs, sure, but never had as big of an issue as Amber implied. And whatever issue he did have was caused by her more than it was the impetus for problems in the relationship. Johnny's entire performance on the stand was self-deprecating enough to make that story believable. He admits to a lot of what would otherwise be used against him and comes across as maybe a little bit of a mess, but in a cute, endearing kind of way. Amber's team seemed to take the opposite approach in how they address some of the allegations against her. And again, the problem starts with Elaine's opening statements. Amber rode horses with her father. She tried to work with him to help him break the horses. She remembers having a broken arm at least four times being in casts during that time. But there were some things she learned from breaking those horses that was very significant. All right, considering Johnny is accusing your client of domestic abuse, why the fuck would you use Amber breaking horses as the allegory for how Amber behaved in that relationship? Even the word breaking just sounds violent. And even still without it, the whole point of breaking a horse is becoming its master, domesticating it. It's not really something you want associated with how your client treated her ex-husband. But that's not all, because Ben Elaine says, Her father taught her she couldn't show fear, she couldn't show pain, and she couldn't show emotion. That's how she could break those horses. It's significant for you to know that so you can understand how Amber could have remained in this relationship with Mr. Depp for as long as she could and the dynamics of some of the abuse you're gonna hear about. And like, Elaine, you know that the jury is going to hear audio recordings of Amber definitely showing a lot of emotion. You might want to spend more time prepping for that than trying to paint a picture in which Amber was super cool-headed and unrattled the entire time. She wasn't. She got angry. She got mean on occasion. Those are things that are going to be impossible to disprove at a certain point. Because a lot of the ways that Johnny's team portrayed Amber had some basis in reality. She got nasty. She said some horrible shit. She did sometimes hit him. Even if she was being 100% reactive every time that happened, and even if Johnny was the instigator of the abuse in the relationship, she still did those things and there are tapes of it. You're not getting ahead of that backlash by saying that she had to show no emotion. It just makes your side look dishonest right off the bat. So some of the things that Johnny and his witnesses said about Amber kinda true in certain circumstances. Johnny and his witnesses made Amber look emotionally unstable, calculated, and at times just plain mean. But the version the jury saw on the stand in May of 2022 seemed pretty nice and calm and maybe a little too rehearsed. What's definitely not true, though, is this idea that Amber Heard is incredibly calculated and manipulative enough to pull off the kind of hoax that Johnny is accusing her of creating with this ragtag group of co-conspirators. In all the research that I've done around this case, I don't think that Amber Heard is calculated at all, which is, like, kind of the problem. In some of the earliest therapy notes from when she first started dating Johnny, Amber was telling Dr. Banks that Johnny was just better at PR than she was. And holy fuck, did that turn out to be catastrophically true. Johnny not only knows exactly what to say to get an audience on his side, he has fantastic instincts for how to say it and how to deflect from an unflattering message. And, and you would sometimes drink whiskey in the mornings too, right? during this time period. Um, isn't happy hour any time? <laughs> um, pills, right? With Marilyn Manson? Um, I once gave uh, Marilyn Manson a pill uh, so that he would stop talking so much. <laughs> <laughs>
you may have been may have been drunk in that video, correct? There's a possibility of that, yes, sir. You you, you poured yourself a um, a mega pint of red wine, correct? A mega pint. Yeah. And then you write, I have other uses for your throat which do not include injury. I have other uses for your throat which do not include injury. Sorry, could you read that again? Do your words, sir, right? There is this idea that seemed to form last year where a lot of people assumed that Amber was just acting on the stand, like she was just reading from a script, whereas Johnny was just being his full authentic self. Little stammers and weirdly paced sentences and all. But Johnny Depp is a good testifying witness for the same reason that he's a good celebrity and a good abuser. A lot of those skills overlap. It's why litigation abuse is so fucking effective. Abusers are typically good at manipulating people, just like attorneys. And in this trial where tens of millions of dollars were on the line, even a hundred million of Amber's claims got awarded their full amount. I guarantee you, everyone on that stand knew exactly what they were gonna say. Maybe not Dr. Spiegel, but everybody else. And while Amber was not being as calculated throughout this entire thing as she probably should have been, she certainly did come across more rehearsed than other witnesses. And she remembers her face was in this dirty, filthy carpet. That's what she remembers and fixated on, the dirty carpet. I was just sitting there on this, on, on this carpet, looking at the dirty carpet. Well, Amber ended up leaving that day and she went out to her car, her Mustang, and she remembers that it was cold and she sat in the car for the longest time and she remembers watching her breath. I got up, I went to the car, I sat in my car and I felt like I sat there forever. I didn't want to turn the key. I just leaned my head up against the window and I remember just seeing my breath on the, on the windshield, you know, on the, the glass of the, uh, of the window of the door. The thing is though, that is just kind of how Amber Heard talks, especially in public appearances where she's obviously planned out what she's gonna say. She has this kind of affected, somewhat showy way of speaking. That my voice didn't, couldn't fully count. That despite what it took for me to stand up and finally raise my voice and to speak my truth, it didn't really matter. And for the record, she writes like that too. Like in her diary entries, where she describes a fight with Johnny by writing, We fell asleep with one another, smashed together in desperate childlike anger. Fear and love finally succumbing to exhaustion and ultimately unavoidable futility. Blah, 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 blah. And none of that makes Amber Heard a liar or inauthentic person. It just makes her someone who talks in a trial court the same way that Lady Gaga talks in late night interviews. A lot of people's suspicions of Amber come from their perceptions of her body language or how rehearsed her talking points seemed. But everybody's talking points are going to be rehearsed when there are millions of dollars on the line. And the jury, by the way, wasn't allowed to read the transcripts during their deliberations. They had to work completely off of their notes and their memory. And that's why people need to understand how much of a trial just comes down to theatrics and who people think put on a more convincing performance. At the end of the day, it's literally just vibes. At, at the end of the day, it's what he was going to say and what she was going to say. And it's a popularity contest in a lot of ways, right? Who, do, who does the jury like more? Who does the jury think is more credible? So I, I think we were really effective at making her come off not credible. But if you're actually trying to get the truth of the matter, the performances should barely come under scrutiny. Was Amber fake crying on the stand at certain points? I don't think so. 
And I think if a lot more people watched the trial in isolation and didn't look at it through the lens of everything that was happening on social media at the time and all the people that were picking apart every single fucking move that Amber made, then I think way less people would have come to the conclusion that she was. But it's still such a useless debate to begin with. Because if Amber had been fake crying on the stand, who cares? It's absolutely possible for someone to recount a really traumatic event in their life without crying or without displaying any obvious indicators of distress. If Amber were faking her crying on the stand, what does that really prove other than the fact that she really, really wanted the jury to believe her? Because anyone in her position would. The perceived believability of her performance on the stand doesn't change the documented evidence that supports her claims. I just, I can't emphasize enough how much I think that no one has ever really been under the kind of mass scrutiny that Amber Heard was under in the spring of 2022. Because there's never been a trial like this before, where even wording something kind of weird could get an alleged victim's account of assault turned into a fucking TikTok trend. I was walking out of the bedroom, slapped me across the face. I turned to look at him and I said, Johnny, you hit me. And for all the fanfare around Amber's relatively minor inconsistencies, which is perfectly normal for someone in her position to have because A, memory isn't infallible, and B, sometimes words just come out of your mouth kinda weird. For some reason, no one cared about all the major inconsistencies in Johnny's story. Like when screenshots came out of Steven Duders admitting via text that Johnny kicked Amber on the plane ride from Boston to Los Angeles, and Johnny's first defense was to claim that the screenshots were fake. That was the story originally. The text messages were doctored until metadata proved otherwise. So then the story switched to, well, okay, Steven did write that, but Johnny just told him to placate Amber. That doesn't mean that Johnny actually did the things that Steven wrote in a text message that he did. He was just agreeing with anything that Amber said to avoid any sort of problem. Except for the fact that in that text exchange, only one person ever mentions Johnny kicking Amber, and it's not Amber. So what exactly was Steven placating? Of course, in the US trial, those texts weren't used as evidence at all because they were deemed hearsay. Hearsay despite the fact that Stephen was on that plane. But let's notice, by the way, that while Stephen was called as a witness in the UK trial, which opened him up to cross-examination and unearthed some wild texts between him and Johnny, Johnny's team decided to not call Stephen as a witness at Fairfax. Instead, they called Stephen's wife for some fucking reason. Was Johnny's team maybe worried that by putting Stephen on the stand that that might allow Amber's attorneys to ask him some questions that Johnny and his team didn't really want answered, like the allegations of hush money. Honestly, I think the fact that Johnny failed so miserably in the UK was actually a secret benefit to him. That trial wasn't filmed, so it didn't have the same impact on the general public's perception of his actions, and he and his attorneys evidently learned through that experience what Johnny could get away with claiming and what he was going to get called out on. Like in the incident where Amber alleged that Johnny headbutted her. Originally, Johnny denied that ever happened. Except then there's an audio recording of him admitting to doing it. You can throw a punch, yeah, you, screaming is okay. You can headbutt somebody screaming, but don't scream. Huh? I headbutted you, fucking. Could we do that? Forehead. Eep, eep. That doesn't break him out. So the story changes to. Well, okay, maybe I did headbutt her, but I had to restrain her because she's so crazy. Once I had restrained her, um, it's, I, I would say, if she's trying to still move around and kick at me or trying to get loose, any sort of movement when you're like this and your heads are to get this close together, it, 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 it's not impossible for, for, um, for them to bump. But a headbutt, a headbutt is, uh, that's pretty extreme. 
Johnny also said that Amber used to call him the monster, which was just a part of her coercive control. He never used the term himself. That was just something that Amber came up with to shame him. Except in March of 2012, when he called himself the monster in an email to Elton John, or in October of 2014, when he said it in a text to an unidentified phone number, or in April of 2015, when he said it in a text to Jerry Judge, or in May of 2015, when he said it in a text to Stephen Duders, or in June of 2015, when he said it in a text to Dr. Kipper. How do you know that Johnny called it the monster? He named it that. For every contradiction you can find in Amber's story, you can find like a hundred more in Johnny's, and his tended to be of greater weight. But don't worry, people can just come up with a hundred other reasons to doubt Amber. Like, how can we believe Amber was physically abused when, yes, there are photos of her alleged injuries, but she probably doctored the photos or edited them in some way. Oh, but then wait. There's metadata showing that Amber did take the photos on the days she said she took the photos and that they weren't edited. All right then, I guess she did her injuries with makeup. Meticulously applied makeup that not only resembled the injuries that she described, but also in some instances portrayed the development of those injuries over the course of days. I mean, you certainly could believe that, but I think it'd be pretty silly. Especially considering the injuries Amber apparently created herself with makeup are relatively subtle. You'd think if she was gonna go to such lengths to frame Johnny, she'd make them look a little worse. Okay, so maybe that could be evidence then. Amber's injuries don't look exactly the way that I thought they would look based on how she described the assaults. Like here are some photos with clear dark marks around her eyes, but they're not completely black and blue. Like I seriously don't understand this argument and people make it all the time. As if Amber not having worse looking injuries somehow justifies the injuries that she did have. I mean, the worst thing you could say is that Amber exaggerated the physical abuse she endured, but is that really the hill you want to die on? If Amber said that Johnny hit her in the face twice, and then we found video footage of him only doing it once, would you really be like, ugh, she's such a drama queen, he barely touched her? Apparently some of you would. But are the photos of Amber really that inconsistent to the injuries she described? No. First of all, for bruises in particular, there are a range of factors that go into how a bruise is gonna show up on your skin. Like your family history, your age, your sex, the exposure you've had to the sun, medications you're on, your diet and exercise regimen, etc. And different parts of your body and face show injuries differently. Since BB Rexa had a phone thrown at her recently while she was performing on stage, some people have used her black eye to disprove Amber's claim that Johnny threw a phone at her face. But there are a lot of places that a phone can land on a face. In BB's case, it appears she was hit in the eye itself, causing her to have significant bruising around the socket. Amber, it appears, was hit more around the brow and then the cheek, like this. That's not necessarily gonna give her bruising around the eye specifically. And I know that because I've been hit by an object in the same general area. In high school, I got hit in the face with this like wooden wheel from a desk, I guess. I don't know, I didn't really get a good look at it when it was like colliding with my face. But someone later told me that it was like a wheel from a desk drawer that like helps the desk open and close more smoothly. I don't really know and it was 11 years ago so I don't really remember. All I really know is that these other kids were throwing it around. It hit me in the face and cut me right here. I was gushing blood at the time. I required stitches. If I wasn't wearing makeup and you got close enough to my face you would still see the scar. And I never got a black eye from it. In fact, I don't think I've ever had a black eye in my life or any sort of significant bruising on my face. And I bruise really easily everywhere else. And that's not uncommon. The face is one of the last things on your body to bruise and the fastest to heal. The fact that we have photos of Amber's face with any bruising is pretty significant. 
Then people have clung to the claims that Amber broke her nose as another way to disprove her because to them, her nose didn't look broken. And I think there's this idea that Amber claimed she broke her nose after one specific incident with Johnny. And that's not really correct. There were multiple incidents in which Amber said that at first, it felt like Johnny had broken her nose, but she didn't seek immediate medical attention. Which, by the way, is common for abuse victims and common for nose fractures. It wasn't until after Amber left the relationship that she said an ENT told her that she had sustained multiple nasal fractures. Perhaps that was from one specific incident, or perhaps it was from just repeated injuries to her face. And for people saying that she had no medical records of her injuries, that's just not true. There's no medical records reflecting that you broke your nose during your relationship with Mr. Depp. Is there a misheard? I don't know what made it in evidence, but I do know that I documented that um, visit and that everything was given to my attorneys. Ms. Heard, you never went to see any doctor or surgeon to treat a broken nose during your relationship with Mr. Depp. Yes or no? I never sought treatment for broken nose while I was with Johnny. Or after you were with Mr. Depp as a result of any injuries you sustained as a result of Mr. Depp? Afterwards, yes, I did and you didn't produce those medical records in this case. I'm gonna object, Your Honor. She did. I did. I, I don't know. All right. They have not been produced, Your Yet Honor. They've not only All right, been- If you would do, so, on approach. I understand why people would think that if you thought you had a broken nose, or if you actually did have a broken nose, you would seek medical attention right away. Because I think a lot of people have an idea of what a broken nose is, or what that injury looks or feels like, that is just way more severe than is often the case. Nasal fractures are incredibly common. They make up about 40% of all bone injuries. And they fall into one of two categories, displaced, and non-displaced. Displaced nasal fractures are what people typically think of when they think of a broken nose because the physical injury is just so visibly evident, and it usually requires surgery or some other specific medical attention. Non-displaced nasal fractures, though, are different, and we probably don't even know how many people actually get them because they're not really that visible. You might have some swelling, soreness, or nosebleeds for a little bit, but they don't even require medical attention. Your nose will look pretty normal, and after time, as long as you don't fuck with it too much, it'll just kind of heal on its own. You might have had a non-displaced broken nose before and not even known it. Normally the swelling after that kind of injury is not as bad as you might imagine, and for me, it wasn't that bad. I have a picture of it underneath the makeup. That's how I know how to reference it. A picture you haven't produced or shown to this jury, right, Ms. Heard? I have, so I've produced everything. But you haven't shown it to this jury? I would very much like to. It's not my job. Of course, even outside of accusations about Amber creating her injuries with makeup, the legitimacy of Amber's photographic evidence has been called into question, with many people somehow inheriting the idea that Amber's metadata was inconsistent or that she edited the photos before submitting them. But that's not true. Amber's metadata was shown over and over and over again to be consistent with her claims. The only person to ever imply that it wasn't was one of Johnny's expert witnesses who never even said that Amber's photos were illegitimate, but that for some of them it was harder to tell if they'd been altered because they went through what he called a photo editing app called Photos 3.0. You know, the default image storing app that comes on every iPhone. And speaking of iPhones, one photo in particular, or rather two photos, have been weaponized against Amber to imply that she was adding a filter onto the photos to show her injuries more. Because Amber and her team submitted two photos taken in 2016 with slightly different hues and lighting, but otherwise identical shots. Amber claimed that these were two separate photos, but they don't look like it. The shadows on her face, the way her hair falls, the direction she's looking. Amber didn't have a great explanation in the court for why that might be, 
So people have tried to use that as evidence that she's just a liar. But there were times when I absolutely identified Amber Heard as probably lying. In fact, there were times when I think I flat out said that is an outright lie or she's confused or something. The picture side by side, she was claiming over and over again that they were different pictures, but it was obvious. I don't need metadata to know, or I don't even need an overlay to know that those two pictures were the same picture. One had a filter on it. But the simpler explanation here is that Amber didn't realize the setting that her camera was on at the time for that photo, and she probably had it on the phone's HDR settings, which for iPhones generations 4 through 12, and Amber was using an iPhone 6, the HDR settings would take two photos of the same image with different exposure settings. This is just yet another non-issue that people acted like was a big deal. Like the entire case hinged on these tiny details about whether or not Amber was adding filters or lying about adding filters, or if Amber was wording the stories of her assaults in the exact right way with the exact right sequencing, or harping on the distinction between donation and pledge. It's just completely missing the forest for the trees at this point. Probably because the forest is full of landmines for anyone defending Johnny Depp. Because if you want to discuss the manipulation of media submitted as evidence to the court, Johnny's exhibits were way more suspicious. Like in the UK, when Johnny's team submitted a photo of his alleged injuries following a fight with Amber in April of 2016, despite metadata timestamping that photo for March 23rd, 2015. And by the way, I'd like to see some of the people saying that Amber's injuries don't look that bad. Tell me what the fuck I'm supposed to be looking at in some of the photos submitted by Johnny's team. Cause like, okay, the photo from March of 2015, not April of 2016, does definitely show something on Johnny's cheek, but that's also from an incident where Amber admitted to hitting Johnny because she said she was worried that he was gonna hurt her sister. And I swung at him. In all of my relationship to date with Johnny, I hadn't landed a blow. And I, for the first time, hit him. Like, actually hit him. Square in the face. And you know, given his age and his general lifestyle, it's probably easier for bruises to show up on Johnny's face than it is on Amber's. I'm just saying. And it's fine, I'm not gonna say that Johnny wasn't actually injured in those photos just because I don't think his injuries are super visible. But if everyone's gonna put Amber's photos under this much scrutiny, can we at least be a little even-handed? Apparently the Fairfax County Court didn't think so, because following Johnny's expert witness putting some of Amber's metadata into question, Amber's team was able to call another expert to rebuke those claims. However, part of that witness's testimony was blocked from being heard by the jury, with unsealed documents revealing that Julian Ackert found evidence suggesting that photos and audio files submitted by Johnny's team had undergone modifications days before being produced to the court. Amber was consistently getting picked apart for things that Johnny was consistently getting away with, especially in the way that the public fucking coddled him. When I first watched Debbie Lloyd's testimony, I was blown away by the amount of non-answers she gave. Every question she was asked, she would just respond with, I don't recall. And you said that um, a decision was made that Amber needed nursing care? Yes. Uh, who made that decision? I don't recall. Do you recall anything about what um, the nasty freak out that Mr. Depp was referring to about Amber? I do not recall. Do you recall going to Mr. Depp's home and seeing him with scraped and bloody knuckles on his right hand? I do not recall. Do you ever recall any incident where Mr. Depp had claimed he punched a whiteboard in the kitchen? I do not. And was were these notes based on your observation of Mr. Depp? I don't recall. Where you wrote, patient kicked in the door of his trailer and refused to speak to director. That's based on your observation of Mr. Depp? I don't recall. And, and where you wrote, patient was verbally aggressive to another person on the set, so no apparent reason. Do you recall what that's based on? I do not. Would it have based, been based on anything other than your observation of Mr. Depp? I don't recall. If you had been told that M Mr. Depp was verbally aggressive, would you have written that in your note? I don't recall. Did you recall ever Mr. Depp not feeling trust for Amber? I don't recall. Did you ever recall Mr. Depp wondering if he and Amber had had a fight or if he was dreaming? 
I don't recall. And with how uncharitable people were about everything that Amber said, I thought for sure if I scrolled down to the comments for that testimony, I would see at least some mild criticism of Debbie not giving any useful information. But all I saw were people praising her for protecting Johnny's privacy, as if it wasn't his team that called her as a witness in the first place. In fact, the only reason this trial was happening at all was because Johnny filed the lawsuit, and his team was the one that pushed for this entire thing to be filmed and live-streamed. Amber even tried to just get her sexual assault testimony away from the cameras, similar to how those details were sealed from public viewing in the UK trial. But she was turned down. If anyone's privacy was being violated in that courtroom, it definitely wasn't Johnny Depp's. And as much as Johnny's team did kind of squash Amber's just in how they presented their arguments, they did not outperform Amber anywhere near as much as people pretend they did. Despite the heaps of videos claiming to feature the best moments from Johnny, or his attorneys, or his witnesses, I've yet to see one best of Amber compilation. And it's definitely not because Amber didn't have any good moments. Her direct examination was a little rough, sure, a little too rehearsed, pretty unnatural looking. But if general audiences didn't already have their heads so far up Camille Vasquez's ass, then maybe they'd recognize that Amber kinda crushed her cross-examination. Mr. Depp got you that role in Aquaman, didn't he? No, Miss Vasquez, I got myself that role by auditioning. That's Mr. how Depp that works. Says, quote, What's your testimony, Mr. McGurvern? Imagine that you were throwing things at Mr. Depp from the mezzanine level down towards where Mr. Depp and Mr. McGovern were standing. Well, he certainly wasn't going to say it about his client. You didn't capture yourself in the mirror in this picture either, did you? I do not see myself in the mirror in that picture. Is that because you didn't have any visible injuries on you? It's because I was taking a picture of the writing. This is the one that Ben King took. And I don't see him in the mirror either. So you heard Miss Lloyd testify under oath that Mr. Depp never threw a can of Red Bull at her. I can't remember uh, if she didn't rem if she didn't recall that or if she said it didn't happen. I don't remember. I vaguely sense she didn't recall anything. You wanted praise for donating the money, right? That's incorrect. You wanted good press. In general, one <laughs> does want good press. Yes. You told Mr. Depp to, D Depp to suck your dick multiple times, didn't you? Yes, I did. Doesn't really look like anyone's been doing cocaine off that table, does it? With all due respect, I'm not sure you know how that works. Doesn't really look like Mr. Depp or anyone was doing cocaine off that table, does it? Uh, I beg to differ with you on that. When you snort cocaine, typically it goes into your nose. And then it doesn't stay residue, on the table. And it's set to the song Miss You by the Rolling Stones, is that right? That's correct. That was a message for Mr. Depp, wasn't it? No, that's ridiculous. Your nose doesn't appear to be injured in any of these pictures, does it, Miss Heard? I'm wearing makeup. Your nose doesn't appear to be injured in any of these pictures, does it, Miss Heard? That's why I'm wearing makeup. It's your testimony, Miss Heard, that you were wearing makeup for this photo shoot? That is correct. It's a photo shoot. No signs of, oh, this is going to be hard, cyanosis, mottling jaundice. It also says I'm a well-nourished male. You testified you took a picture of your face after this. I did. But you didn't show that picture to the jury, did you? I would like to. But you didn't show it, did you? That's not up to me. Where in this interrogatory response, Ms. Heard, you describe Mr. Depp, quote, grabbing you by the pubic bone, pubic area, and pushing you down. On page 64. Where? Page 64, uh, one, two, three paragraphs down. And Johnny also had way more flop moments than people remember. Mr. Depp, this is the picture that your counsel showed you both in um, your prior, or, or showed you this morning, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And that mark under your left eye is what you claim to be a black eye caused by Miss Heard, correct? Um, seems to be there's some scratches around my nose as well. Okay. All right, but... That it's your your left eye, the one close to the chef. That's that's what your you says your your black eye, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And that was the picture your team chose to show you, right? Let's pull up exhibit nineteen oh five, Michelle, please. These are four pictures of you, right? 
Yes, it did. Yeah. And, yeah. and below it, it they indicate that they were taken on July 24th, 2015 in Bangkok, Thailand. Correct? Objection, lack of foundation, calls for speculation. Overruled. In Bangkok, Thailand, so before the train ride. Correct, before the train ride, because you yeah. didn't get on the train ride till the 25th, is that right? I, 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 somewhere in that area, I guess. Okay. Mr. Depp, in these pictures that were taken before you got on the train ride for your honeymoon, where you claim that Miss Heard hit you and gave you a black eye, you have the exact same shadow or sunburn or mark under your left eye. The exact uh, same mark, don't you? That's the... Um... When you get a side light, you see the occipital mm -hmm. bone. So that is the exact area. Yep. And it's actually a side you, light will cause that. Yeah. As well, the well. picture's not being taken from the side, is it? It's being taken no, no, head no, no, on, no, no, isn't no, it? No, no, no. The lens in front. Yep. The light on the side. Right. Will cause that occipital bone, I believe it's called, mm -hmm. to to appear sunken. Just like lights on the side of a train car, correct? Objection well, calls for speculation. You can take that down, Michelle. That was in fact in the dark. People on either side of me, so I don't see where the light fill is from the side there. Mr. Jeff, you can wait for the next question. Next question. Next question. Sorry. You said before that if, if you want to be with a woman sexually, that she is rightfully yours, haven't you? Could you repeat that? And you've also said that with Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, yeah, that if you want to be with a woman sexually, that she is rightfully yours. That's ludicrous. You've also said that with respect to women that you want to be with, you've remarked, I need, I want, I take, haven't you? Equally as ludicrous, no. Can you pull up DX883, please? Mr. Depp, these are text messages from you to Stephen Duders. On February 22nd, 2017, correct? Um, this, no, this looks nothing like me. You might have mistaken. Uh... Mr. Depp, we can show the full unredacted. You've looked at a number of text messages in this case, and the words him as the identifier, that's you, correct? In every text message we've seen in this case. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. It yeah. still doesn't mean it hasn't been screwed with. That's not anything that I've ever said or written. You want to see the whole the whole thing unredacted? We can look at that too. No, because you could have typed it up last night. No. Yeah. I can assure you I didn't type it up last night, Mr. Depp. Your Honor, I'd move for the admission of Exhibit 883. 883 in evidence as redacted. Thank you. Mr. Depp, are, you're aware that these are text messages. You, you can see the bottom right where it says death and then it has a number, 8129. Those are produced by you in this litigation. You understand that, right? I understand that. Okay. Mr. Depp, on February 22nd, 2017, you texted Mr. Duders, right, exactly. Molly's pussy is rightfully mine. Should I not just bust in and remove its hinges tonight? Did I read that right? You read it right. And the one beneath that, you say, I want to change her understanding of what it is like to be thrashed about like a pleading mackerel. And then in all caps, you write, I need, I want, I take. Did I read that right? You read it right, but I did not write that. Okay. You poured yourself a, a mega pint of red wine, correct? A mega pint? <laughs> yeah. Let's look at UK 101, please. Just since you, you, you seemed amused by the terminology, um, you were asked the question, question, you were drunk, I'm going to suggest. What do you say to that? Answer, I may have been, I do not recall. The chances are very good that, if, that I was, if I was upset. Question, we saw you pour a sort of, answer, mega pint. Question, mega pint of red wine, which is not everybody's choice for breakfast, is it? Answer, no. Did I read that right? You did. Clearly, no one commenting on this trial was really making an effort to be fair to both sides. The public discourse around this case was always lopsided in Johnny's favor because this entire excursion was never about finding the truth about what happened. It was about producing entertaining content. 
Prior to the trial starting, much of the content created for the Anti-Amber Brigade came from specifically anti-feminist fears trying to correlate this case to larger beliefs about female accusers being untrustworthy and opportunistic. By April of 2022, though, the pro-Johnny campaign was fronted by creators that seemed much more reasonable and unbiased. A lot of them were providing their commentary via livestream while regularly interacting with chats full of Johnny supporters who'd been recruited into his online army in the years between 2016 and 2022. Anyone watching this trial live was already getting fed with anti-Amber propaganda, and especially for content creators at the mercy of their audiences, of course they were gonna start leaning in the same direction as their viewers. And obviously there was a financial incentive to stay close to the script the rest of the internet had already laid out. People made bank off of their coverage of this trial. Court TV and the Law & Crime YouTube channel earned record-breaking views, for one thing. And they didn't just live stream the trial and leave it at that. And one man who brought this case because he wanted the world to see everything. He wanted the world to know the truth because his life had been turned upside down by allegations that he was a wife beater, an abuser. And he said, like, no, I'm not. And, and in our country, what you can do, you can take someone to court, sue them for defamation. Virtually impossible to win, especially if you're a celebrity, but he did. And, and to me, the amazing thing that we saw transpire there were two celebrities, he's an A-lister, she's a, I don't know, whatever lister. Court TV did interviews with Camille Vasquez. They published videos highlighting the fans showing up to support Johnny. They had behavior experts offering commentary on whether or not Amber was really crying on the stand. While the Law & Crime Network was uploading compilations like Top Johnny Depp Comebacks, Top 10 Moments of Johnny Depp Arriving at Court, Top 10 Moments of Johnny Depp Leaving Court, or Every Time Johnny Depp Laughed in Court. Then there were all the people making money off of watching the streams. Emily D. Baker, a LawTuber who livestreamed her reactions every day of the trial, received the highest viewership count of her career during the reading of the verdict. From just before the trial started until about a week before it ended, her subscriber count doubled. Emily wasn't new to the format. She's a former LA prosecutor who first came to prominence on YouTube a few years ago as a real lawyer covering high-profile legal cases like the Tati Westbrook Halo Beauty disputes or Britney Spears conservatorship case. So for a legal standpoint though, the IUD, the, the rehab treatment, the lithium, preventing her from getting married, all of that legal? All of that legal. That's not true. Not for a California probate conservatorship anyway, which is what Britney was in. Whatever. Point is, prior to all this bullshit, Emily was already being seen by a lot of people as a reliable source of information for anything related to the law. Even areas she has no real expertise in, like the probate court, which, to my knowledge, Emily has never worked in. But Emily's coverage of the Depp v. Heard trial catapulted her into LawTube fame as a neutral source of information, despite the obvious pro-Johnny slant to her content. You know, after this, I, uh, I was getting close to his kids and he had um, interesting stint of sobriety af shortly after that. I was getting that. close to his kids, not his kids and, and I were close. it felt really good again. And Just, shortly after that- Then the Legal Bites YouTube channel hosted by lawyer Alita Majeka both live streamed the trial, sometimes for upwards of 11 hours a day, and created additional video summaries following each day's stream. That channel more than tripled its subscriber account over the duration of the trial, and in the month of April alone, Alita earned over $47,000. While she promoted some fucking tea company that you could get 10% off of if you used Alita's promotional code, Amber Turd. Legal Bite streams often featured panels of other law tubers, including our previously mentioned friend Riketa Law, who on his own channel earned over $135,000 during his coverage of the trial. During the month of May, Emily, Aleda, and Riketa earned more money from Super Chats on their live streams than any other creator on YouTube. <laughs> there are three YouTubers, me being one of them, who made a quarter million dollars or more covering Johnny Depp in three months. It's unreal amounts of money because we're all just dummies on the internet 
who were dummies off the internet before this and suddenly were making insane amounts of money. And you know, I'm sure that Aleda openly associating herself with known misogynists like Ricada Law will only benefit her and protect her from being put under the same kind of scrutiny that she helped put Amber Heard under. And there's been a lot of criticism about the way that I said certain things, things can be misinterpreted. Anything I say can be misinterpreted. That is true of literally anyone. Folks talking about my 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 facial reaction, how I'm I'm smiling, how I'm laughing. Anyway, other well-established creators with more general interest content also benefited from jumping on this bandwagon. Here are the stats. My most viewed streams ever by month since I joined YouTube was at 85K. That was my highest viewed stream ever before today, where I got 87K watching the trial. This is sad to look at for me. This is embarrassing because I have put work and effort and passion into projects like Mogul Money or the Poker Event or, or whatever else, and they were dwarfed by me being a vehicle in which people would consume a court case they would have watched anyway. A lot of the most popular content surrounding this case, though, came from so-called professionals of different fields, with trial footage finding its way into the psychologist reacts, lawyer reacts, and body language expert reacts genres especially. The insidious problem with these kinds of videos is how they represent an appeal to authority fallacy. They are real lawyers and real psychologists talking about this case. And since this case involves the law and human psychology, their perspectives on the matter must be worth listening to, right? Amber said that she used the word pledge and donate synonymously. I wonder if this is one of the problems with Amber Heard. She doesn't realize that words can mean different things. For example, she appears to believe that telling a lie is the same thing as telling the truth, and she doesn't see a distinction between a bed and a bathroom. Now, of course, expert opinion is always going to be important when trying to evaluate a complex case like this. The average viewer doesn't have the training to parse through all the information presented to them through the lens of court TV pool cameras in the most informed, responsible way possible. Trust me, the last thing that I think should happen in a case like this is for the average viewer to just be abandoned by experts to make their own opinion without having the resources or the training or the knowledge to do so. But that is kind of what happened here when trusted media outlets neglected to take this story seriously in the first place. They just left it all up to internet dumbasses like me to go through all these court documents ourselves. The only reason I'm able to give more informed commentary on this situation than a lot of the other content creators who covered it is that one, my expertise is in celebrity bullshit, which was way more imperative for understanding this case than a lot of people seem to realize. And two, I just look deeper into it than a lot of other people. Because I was never live streaming this, so I never had to come up with an opinion on the spot before I had all of the information. And because I'm just a know-it-all to my core and I hyper fixate on things. Because while the other experts making YouTube videos about Depp v. Heard might have useful knowledge in their respective fields like psychology or the law, barely any of them had any expertise in this particular case. They were just reacting to the same court TV or law and crime live streams as anyone else in their audience, often without doing any sort of prior research on the matter. And that's a huge problem. Audiences assume that by watching a real, albeit typically non-practicing professional, offer their commentary on a real interpersonal or legal dispute, the information communicated by such a professional must be reliable and fact-checked. But you don't have to fact-check stuff before you say it on YouTube.com. Alita from Legal Bites certainly didn't fact check herself before she said this. Do we need to remind you, you were not a party to that litigation. You were a witness. Do we need to remind you that you were not cross-examined in the UK, but you were cross-examined in Virginia? Amber was absolutely put under cross-examination in the UK for multiple days. And the transcripts are completely accessible for anyone on the internet to go look at them. See, it even says at the top of the section right here, heard cross-examined by Ms. Laws. Now I presume that Alita is at least a real lawyer. I don't know, admittedly I didn't check, I'll just take her word for it. But when she's not spreading misinformation about Amber Heard, 
I presume that she does know something about the law, considering there is an entire process that goes into being able to practice it. Other areas of expertise have quite a lot less gatekeeping. Like, what exactly does someone have to do to be considered a body language expert? Body language analysis is a pseudoscience that takes speculative reasoning and passes it off as an evidence-based scientific endeavor. Studies have repeatedly shown that human beings are piss poor at recognizing deception based on nonverbal cues. We can identify lies from other people with an accuracy rate of about 54%. And there's no reliable evidence that you get better with practice. The facial expressions are more overplayed than I've ever seen in my entire life. And keep in mind, I'm not just some dude on YouTube. I've been doing this for well over 30,000 hours uh, of my life. The body language content community might as well flip a coin before they make their videos. But they don't do that. Instead, they use their self-identification as a so-called expert to aid their audience's confirmation bias, often making videos that align with whatever the popular opinion of the moment is. Ellen DeGeneres got exposed for fostering a toxic work environment on the set of her show. Here's a YouTube video pointing out all the red flags the public previously ignored of this monster celebrity liar, like the time she tapped her fingers on her right hand too quickly. Colleen Ballinger is in the middle of a pretty intense cancellation right now, for good reason. So, here's a video of possibly YouTube's biggest body language expert, Observe, talking about how manipulative her apology was. As if anyone with sufficient knowledge of that situation needed an expert to tell them that. Colleen's video is on its face ridiculous, and I don't have to look at her body language to decide that. I don't even have to factor in the whole ukulele thing, though. That was a fun touch. Nobody goes to these videos to gain new, unprejudiced information. They go to watch a so-called expert pile on to a popular consensus, whether positive or negative. When Jenna Marbles, someone the internet does almost unanimously approve of, made her own apology video for past mistakes in 2020, Observe's video in reaction to that was of course a lot more flattering to Jenna than any of his videos featuring a less agreeable public figure. The top comment on that video is literally, let's be honest, you clicked on this just to listen to him talk about how genuine and honest she is. Because yeah, that's the service that these videos provide. If you do a quick look through all of Observe's videos, his overall conclusions are usually agreeable, no matter the pseudoscientific route he used to get there. It's bad person bad, good person good, at least as good or bad as the general public perceives them. That lends credibility to the idea that this body language thing has something to it, since the videos tend to not diverge too far from the ideas that the creator's audience is already on board with. When there's not such an established outside consensus, though, the flaws inherent in this genre become a little bit more obvious. Like when body cam footage of Brian Laundrie and Gabby Petito first hit the internet, before the consensus became fixated on the idea, which turned out to be true, that Brian murdered Gabby. There was a lot of speculation initially that Brian Laundrie had been abusive to his girlfriend and had something to do with her disappearance. But then, body cam footage of the couple following a dispute prior to the disappearance became public, showing Gabby as far more emotional and combative than Brian, who remained calm and reasonable. When Observe saw that video, his initial conclusion was that Brian Laundrie probably hadn't been abusive to Gabby. He probably just separated himself from her due to the toxicity of the situation or whatever. That's why he came home days later, in her car, while she was nowhere to be found. I don't know exactly what Observe said other than what other people wrote about his video at the time, because for some reason, his initial video has been privated. Guess it's not really a good look to have evidence of you defending a man who strangled his girlfriend to death on your channel. But when the body cam footage of Brian and Gabby first came out, Observe was definitely not the only person who thought that that footage complicated the situation. If you isolated Brian and Gabby's entire relationship to what was shown in that one video, Gabby does look like the more problematic one of the pair. Even outside of body language, she admits to being mean. She also admits to hitting Brian, while he tells the cops that she's crazy, but he loves her anyway. 
Suspicion around Brian Laundrie increased with time as more evidence came to the forefront and he remained totally elusive about what happened. Eventually, he skipped town and confessed to killing Gabby via a note found by his own remains. So there is no ambiguity. Brian Laundrie killed Gabby Petito. And that body cam footage has to now be put into its proper context where Gabby is rightfully considered a victim. Around late 2021, early 2022, that case prompted a lot of public discussion about what abuse can sometimes look like, leading many people to become aware of a concept called DARVO, something everyone conveniently forgot about just a few months later, but it stands for Deny, Attack, Reverse Victim and Offender. It describes a process in which an abuser denies an accusation of wrongdoing in the relationship, attacks their victim, especially by challenging their mental or emotional stability, then portrays themselves as the true victim to their victim's abuse. This becomes a fairly easy and effective tactic once the abuser's victim starts exhibiting reactive abusive behaviors themselves. Abusive relationships provoke a whole lot of anxiety and fear in their victims. And the longer they go on, they can push a victim into a near constant state of fight or flight. Of course, that means that some people are going to respond with fight. We already know that that one audio recording where Amber admits to hitting Johnny is deceptive in how it's edited, given the dialogue that was cut out. But even if we didn't have the transcripts pointing to that, that was still a recording that took place in the last seven months of a four and a half year long relationship that Amber was reporting to her therapist had gotten physically abusive in the first three months. But that context was not taken into consideration for a lot of people. When those clips started hitting the internet at the beginning of 2020, the discourse around Amber and Johnny's relationship was already spreading beyond the MRA and Johnny Depp stan communities that had led the initial charge against Amber. This is where we started to see more Psychologist Reacts content, along with a whole lot of body language expert analysis. The body language discourse is important for two reasons. One, it spread a lot of harmful rhetoric about what abuse does or doesn't look like. Years before the trial even started, Observe was picking apart footage from Amber's 2016 deposition following her filing for a restraining order and specifically taking a lot of issue with the fact that Amber was eating at times during the questioning. She was also just eating food, which you'll see that more in this deposition, which is so annoying. Why is she eating? It's like, why? It's not sustenance. They're snacky foods. I don't think that a person who is on trial for alleged assault accusations involved in a relationship would just be casually snacking and acting like she's so unenthused about what's going on. If she's actually the victim, why is she not more passionate about it? This is not a good indicator for Amber being the victim. It's a very good indicator for her being an abuser. Do you recognize the voices on that tape? Mm -hmm. And who are the people on that tape? It's Johnny and I. Okay. Important thing. She talked with her mouth full there, right? She just answered the question because it's a no doubt question. Who's in it? It's Johnny and I. And she said that through a mouthful of food. Mm. Wow, what a pause. And it's interesting because we saw earlier that she's comfortable talking with her mouth full, but now she's not. What an interesting thing. Now she doesn't want to talk with her mouth full. Cause real victims are too sad to snack apparently. Johnny Depp can doodle in a courtroom and his fans will just act like that's a cute symptom of his ADHD. A disorder by the way that Amber Heard also does have but she's getting shit on for having a little bite to eat in a 2016 deposition that the public should never have had access to in the first place. Whether or not you believe Amber Heard specifically, these kinds of talking points are just unacceptable. And I think a lot of people would have found that kind of thing more problematic had the person these statements were targeting been someone that a greater percentage of people felt invested in defending. Because the second thing that we can learn from the body language analysis of Amber Heard is that by 2020, two years before the trial even started, the popular consensus on the internet was already pro-Johnny. From like 2016 to 2019, many of the people discussing the Johnny Depp Amber Heard saga were from communities that a lot of people wouldn't find very credible. 
It was Johnny Depp stands who were of course gonna side with him. MRA and incel communities who were of course gonna take the opportunity to call a woman a liar. And conspiracy theorists who of course wanted to support Adam Waldman's war against the mainstream media. By mid-2022, the idea that there was a specific political agenda behind a lot of anti-Amber rhetoric was replaced with the idea that everyone just hates Amber Heard because she sucks. Over the course of the defamation trial between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, it's become very clear that Amber Heard is hated by almost everyone on the internet. Some of the most popular hashtags online read, Justice for Johnny Depp, Amber Heard is a liar, and I believe Johnny Depp. I'm Mackenzie, and let's break down the top 10 reasons why everyone hates Amber Heard. Cause yeah, right-wing media is milking the fuck out of this spectacle and using it as a way to disparage the entire Me Too movement, but the popular leftist streamer Hassan Piker is also on Twitch deriding Amber Heard supporters as nothing but a bunch of radical fem cells or something. In the upcoming days, you are going to see rad fems go fucking bananas mode, okay? You're gonna see Vanity Fair, uh, L, uh, all of these other outlets, like Good Morning America, like every other fucking mainstream media outlet, maybe Good Morning America might side with Johnny Depp a little bit, but like, they're all going to go fucking bananas mode, talking about how like, you know, Johnny Depp was violent actually and the court was wrong, yada, 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 all this other stuff. And no one really thought it was that weird at the time because propaganda is the most effective when it doesn't feel like propaganda. Creators knew this was the biggest source of discourse on the internet at the time, and some of them probably thought that not only did they have a right to weigh in, but that by weighing in, they were creating a space for discourse on the topic that wasn't quite as toxic and uninformed as that of the Daily Wire or that Umbrella Guy's YouTube channel. I was a vehicle, and maybe this is a little cocky, but I think of all the vehicles you could have watched it in, this car wasn't too bad, because I feel like I did try to weed out the fucking weirdos who were so pro Johnny Depp they wouldn't even listen to the court case, or just try to be at least a beacon of information on defamation and defamation court cases. Once the controversy started generating enough buzz though, even more creators had an incentive to weigh in, and even more incentive to pander to one side specifically, the side that had already developed the more intense online following. By the way, we are pro, this is a pro Johnny broadcast. I just want to make that clear up front. Very much. This is a pro Johnny, uh, was outside the court yesterday actually. Uh, to greet him when he came out when you're, you're of the court to, with yeah. a sign that says, we love you, Johnny. Right so I am, lip, just for everyone correct. tuning in. And I don't want to make it seem like I think all the people commenting on the trial last year were knowingly contributing to a harassment campaign or that they were just trying to profit off of an abuse case. They were still aiding a very toxic spectacle, and some of them got really defensive when other people pointed that out. I don't know why the fuck they're saying this about me, especially, um, considering the fact that, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a fucking news broadcaster, dumbasses, at Kotaku. I do, you know, kind of uh, what you do, you know? Why am I, what the fuck? After saying that, the news broadcaster Hassan Piker went on several rants that either took incredibly important information out of context or presented blatantly untrue information. For example, not many people talked about this, but like the UK Oibrov uh, judge stated that because of his alcohol and drug abuse, that, uh, you know, there was at least enough evidence to suggest that Johnny Depp was the violent and responsible party in 12 of the 14 acts of violence, including in ones where Amber Heard literally fucking cut Johnny Depp's finger off. Think about that. It blows my fucking mind like that, that the judge straight up was like, yeah, you deserved it. <laughs> anyway. All right, so that objection implies that the cause of Johnny Depp's injury to his finger had ever been established in the UK court, which it hadn't. The judge in that trial says pretty clearly on record, what exactly caused the injury is uncertain. It should definitely not just be taken as fact that Amber was responsible, especially considering all the evidence to the contrary. 
Like Johnny's unfactual statements about the time elapsed between being injured and seeking medical assistance, the inconsistent claims to his coherency throughout the ordeal, the multiple text messages he sent to other people stating that he cut off the tip of his finger, the audio recording in which Johnny mentions his finger and Amber says, So when I say that I thought you could kill me, that doesn't mean you count her with you also, uh, that, that, that you lost your own finger. Which Johnny does not contradict. I don't know which fight you're talking about. I don't know. I'm which talking one. about Australia the day that. Now I we're talking about thing. Australia. Do I believe that like uh, a, a fucking bottle that exploded ultimately ended up like cutting his fucking finger? Yes, I do believe that. Why wouldn't I believe that? What is? What do you believe? Do you believe that he like sat there, took a knife, and like chopped this fucking finger off? Because that was kind of Amber Heard's. That was Amber Heard's team's uh, uh, argument. Is that what you believe? You think Johnny Depp literally was like, Oh, it's time. I'm Johnny Depp. I love I love cutting my dominant hand's finger off. Uh, I love I love getting a knife and, and cutting my dominant hand's finger off. Remember, dominant hand. If he fucking cut like his non-dominant hand, if he got the pinky, like he's fucking Yakuza, that's one thing. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Literally, nobody thought he cut it off with a knife. I can't even put that toward my myth counter, because the absurd, bad faith take that Hassan is presenting here is pretty singular to him. It just wouldn't feel right to put it amongst the claims that I come across more often. But for the record, Amber never said that she even knew what happened to Johnny's finger. The explanation that she thinks makes the most sense is that it happened while Johnny was slamming a phone up against a wall. And considering the hospital that treated him wrote in their notes that they thought the injury was caused by some sort of crushing mechanism, I think her explanation is as good as any. But Hassan isn't even the worst offender of misinformation. Not by a long shot. And for the record, I don't dislike him, nor do I think that he's as stupid as some of the things he says occasionally implies. And that's what makes it worse. If even someone like Hassan, who knows how the media works, who knows how propaganda works, and who should realize how lopsided a trial is going to be in which one party is 300 times richer than another, can so unquestioningly swallow misinformed anti-Amber rhetoric and then repeat it to his millions of viewers without a second thought, then what fucking chance did Amber Heard have? Cause whether they properly see themselves as a news source or not, content creators are the filter that a lot of people get their information through. I don't expect everyone to get everything 100% right all the time. I haven't. And I get corrected by people in my comment section constantly. Like in part one of this series, I incorrectly put up a photo of Amber's dog Pistol while talking about her other dog Boo. Then in part two, I said that Johnny was 24 when he first started dating a 17 year old Winona Ryder, when in fact, he was 26. Making small, mostly inconsequential errors is totally fine. But telling your audience that you think the judgment in the UK trial is invalid because the judge told Johnny that he deserved to have his finger cut off when that literally never happened is so supremely irresponsible, especially coming from a man who clearly knows that his platform is seen as a news source. You can chalk up Hassan Piker's terrible coverage of this trial as just evidence that online leftist men are secret misogynists or whatever. And yeah, I do think Hassan and a lot of his colleagues have a blind spot when it comes to gender. But it wasn't just men stoking this bullshit. Uh, Johnny Depp wanted it televised because if he didn't, there'd be no way he would have any shot at winning because courts are very, uh... Is it misandrist where they hate men and women are always right and men are always in the wrong regardless of evidence so that's why he wanted to televise because boomers be like women are angels and queens <laughs> Though female Twitch streamer Pokimane has been victim of her own fair share of misogynistic online harassment, she found plenty of joy in mocking Amber Heard's trauma alongside her fellow creators. To the point that her streams for this trial featured a fucking tear counter for Amber's testimony. More, it went from asking me about how my kissing scene went or how the sex scene went to asking me what James Franco had done in the scene to being really explicit about my body, 
you know, he was talking about my, he was saying huh? really disgusting things about my body, about huh? how I liked it, huh? how I responded. Huh? And then he started huh? taunt, just straight up taunting huh? me. I, I know you liked it. He called me a go-getter. I just remember very slow movements and I slowly get up and move to the front of the plane and he starts oh, it's throwing things at me. Ice cubes, utensils. He's calling me a, um, a go-getter and then an embarrassment. Talking about what an embarrassment I am. God, that sounds like such a grandpa I don't thing. know how many times I moved throwing seats. I wish cubes. I did. I don't, oh, I remember moving more than once and Johnny came oh, to me it. each time, not the other way around. He sits down in front of me at one point and because I'm not answering him, I was looking out of the window I saw two and he slaps my time. face. Say tears, question mark. Bumblebee tips $2. And Thank you for inspiring me to scream friend smile. Oh, you're so is in our proximity. And again, Pokimane's commentary on this situation wasn't even that bad comparatively. This is what the reasonable people thought was acceptable. It cannot be overstated how fucking loud the discourse of Depp v. Heard became on the internet. For this video, I've been trying to keep a list of all the people that covered the trial last year and either spread some sort of misinformed talking point or just mean, hateful rhetoric about Amber. And every time I think I have a semi-complete list of at least all the content creators or public figures with a decently sized platform, I become aware of somebody else that said something fucking stupid about Amber. Like I was just casually watching Nick Green and Dev Lemons the other day talking about something completely unrelated and found out that Dominic Fike said this. Yo, so I'm gonna just come straight out and say it. I'm gonna come out and say it. I'm gonna be real with y'all. I actually, I think Amber Heard is hot, dude. I don't know. I was watching the trial, dude. I know, I know it's not a popular opinion and it's not the focus at the moment, dude. But I've been having these visions of her. Just beating me up. I think it's hot. Shout out to Nick and Dev and any of the other creators who didn't participate in this pile on, by the way. It was absolutely an option the entire time. Next meme involves private information, trauma, physical and emotional abuse. But I just hate this bitch so much that it's worth memeing. I am on the feeder. It's like one layer of crazy. It's a seven layer dip of insanity. It's. <laughs> It's truly amazing just to sit back and read the transcripts of what they've done to each other. Every night I get in bed and I'm like, dude's like, this needs to be on TV. At this point, we're sitting next to each other on the edge of the couch, or I was on the edge of the couch. I was just sitting there on this, on, on this carpet, looking at the dirty carpet, wondering how I wound up on this carpet and why I was never why i never noticed that the carpet was so filthy before and i just didn't know what else to do i didn't know what to say i didn't know how to react please i've had a really hard time my dog stepped on a bee and then i was on the couch and then i was on the floor and the floor was so dirty and i was thinking why is the floor so dirty y'all know what fucking time it is you know what time it is my dog stepped on a bee she stepped on a bee my dog stepped on a fucking bee. Mrs. Hurd, can you just please be honest? I assaulted Johnny and divorced him because I wanted money. I would like to also apologize to peace. <laughs> My dog stepped on a bee. We took him to the vet. I actually managed to squeeze out a tear. You see, that's how it's done. That's how you actually cry. Although she sat up on the stand, y'all, and cried without a single tear. Oh, I see, because she looked, you, you see right here, that's clever. She looked at the person who's taking the picture. You see the flash happen right there? So it's obvious that she made eye contact with the, with the photographer. Man, that really is something. Amber Heard snorting coke on the stand is the craziest thing I have ever seen. Yeah, did you see she, it? she definitely did not do cocaine on the stand. No. Yeah, I Although, don't. Although, but she's that crazy. It's like they are just 
having the time of their lives. <laughs> and this is a far cry from Amber saying that she suffers from PTSD and panic attacks every five seconds. All right, so, so okay, I just want to mention this. Uh, the fact that Amber is completely fine with looking at Johnny all the time is very showing because when you are abused by someone, uh, you shouldn't be comfortable looking at them. If she was abused by Johnny, she would be terrified to even look at him. One YouTube channel called Observe focuses on nonverbal communication, which, oh my God, I'm obsessed with nonverbal communication. This channel is everything to me. I'm so happy they blew the fuck up. Though this channel's videos are for entertainment purposes only, I'm not trying to say this is legal evidence or admissible in court or anything. The professional read done on Amber Heard suggested she was extremely uncomfortable with the questions the judge asked her. And by that, I don't mean she was uncomfortable talking about the assault, but she just didn't like Amber answering questions from the judge in general. If you really shut your eyes, shut your ears, and let your instincts guide you, you would know that she's full of shit. Even Amber's outfits clearly meant to suggest honesty and respectability scream fake. Yes, she needs to dress a certain way for court, but there's no semblance of her real self there. From her hair to her clothes, it feels like a costume, and that is perceived as an intent to deceive. His performance is so theatrical that the audience is just as convinced as the spectators at the Johnny Depp trial. And I'm not trying to discount that maybe Amber felt trapped in Australia, who really knows? But I feel like if you're a hostage, you wouldn't have access to a phone, a working phone where you could call anyone. All of these things say to me that she has over inflating her testimony. And so I have to call into question everything that she has said. But yeah, just seeing her blame this setback or this distrust in women now that has been created, to me to blame that on the verdict is so hypocritical. It's just so lacking self-awareness to see that the reason that there is that problem now or might be that problem now isn't because of the verdict, it's because of her lying profusely. And then if you wanna cover up a bruise, um, you obviously put foundation first, concealer, and then on top of that, um, I used a, like a, a bruise kit, not a bruise kit, it's a theater makeup kit, a color correction kit, but I used, I called it my bruise kit. That was Amber Heard's defense attorney, Lane uh, Breithoff, during opening statements, talking about the makeup kit that Amber allegedly carried with her at all times to make sure her bruises stayed hidden. Now recently, however, the company that manufactures the makeup kit posted a video on their official TikTok account, contradicting the claim, revealing that the makeup kit in question wasn't released until 2017, which is the year after the couple's divorce. Uh, yeah, this is what I was talking about as a color correction kit. This is not obviously the exact one I used to carry, but I used to carry with me. This is not obviously the exact one I used to carry. Some happy news for Johnny Depp, uh, because, well, he hasn't had, he hasn't had anything but happy news the last few months since that trial, and now MTV wants him to play a role in the VMAs. Johnny Depp makes an appearance in Rihanna's Savage X Fenty Fashion Show Volume 4. Johnny is fresh from winning his libel lawsuit against ex-wife Amber Heard, and appearing in Rihanna's fashion show is another step for Johnny to return to the Hollywood limelight after he was blacklisted for years. Starbucks I go to has tip jars that have Johnny versus Amber on them. It's obvious that she has a track record for lying. I think that Amber's entire defense is that Johnny struggles with the disease of addiction, and they spent so much time going over pictures that Johnny calls perfectly placed of him falling asleep with ice cream. But he looks like he's struggling. He's got weakness, he keeps going back to uh, pills and alcohol, ice cream's falling all over him, etc. Meanwhile, she's taking pictures, she's recording everything nonstop, getting him on tape. I mean, they were only married 18 months. Now Amber comes in and she shows a bunch of photos of Johnny passed out again, which again, makes me cringe seeing these photos, knowing that she collected these photos. That to me does not seem like a woman who loves her husband. It is mind blowing to me that she is going to say that she took a photo of the bruise from that incident, but not her face. Fuck you, Amber. I don't know how that night ended. Oh, come on. I don't I'm remember listening. what happened. What? I don't remember. 
Good morning, Your Honor. Mr. Depp, how are you? Big fan. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, how are you? I, I think about something here, okay? You're in uh, the worst time of your career. You're you will have these court cases piling up. Is it really the right time to have a child? Isn't it kind of odd that she chose to have a child right now when everybody literally hates her? Honestly, this feels like another publicity uh, thing where she wants people to be sympathetic because now she's a mom. This is just my bias. This is just my opinion. But it is incredible. It's kind of sus that she would have a child that through surrogate with no dad just when, you know, Things are heating up. Mm, but she's not really a she's not really a, a maternal kind of person. Now I know people can change and all of those sort of things, but yeah. what we've seen on display from her is not someone who's, you know, can really genuinely care about anybody else, um, except herself. So yeah. I don't know. I I just find it very suspect that she um she had a baby just appeared out of nowhere. I don't even know what's going I I just know that she's a bad person and she's hit him a few times. The only good thing is Everybody knows now, and this is a good thing. This is one of the reasons why it's good that he did this. Everyone knows now, like there's something wrong with her. And I frankly did not know who she was prior to her relationship with Johnny Depp. And still, I only know her for Aquaman 2 and domestic violence. So uh, what has Amber Heard done? She's famous for shitting in a bed, okay? Take this out. Did you ever take a poop in his bed? No, I did not take a poop in his bed. I was defecating in the bathroom and I miscalculated how close I was to the toilet. That honestly is, like, demented. Like, it really is. Like, that's just fucked up. Wait, do they have proof that it's Amber's shit? They just think it is. I, I, I can't say yes or no. I, I don't know enough information about it. I just, from what I've seen, it does seem like there would be evidence by how many people are just factually well, saying that it's her. Your Honor, we've recently found surveillance footage of the House staff discovering the alleged fecal matter on Mr. Depp's bed. Oh, word? Objection! That still wouldn't prove my client is guilty of anything. That's true, but I'll allow it because it does sound fun and this trial is for fun. As one person in Twitch chat said, Amber Heard made her bed and it was time she shit in it. You know, they're seeing through Amber Heard and soon she will be Amber Unheard. Got him. Boom. <laughs> so what possessed people to become so outrageously cruel to this one woman? It was fun. I won't deny that parts of the trial were entertaining in the same kind of perverse way that the People vs. O.J. Simpson was entertaining. Where the 90s had Kato Kalin, the 2020s had this dude vaping in a car. Even the whole Amber Turd thing is proof in and of itself that people just wanted to laugh at some petty celebrity drama, whether or not the things that they were laughing at even happened. There are three explanations for how the mystery fecal matter got onto that bed. One, Amber pooped in her own bed to get back at Johnny, who wasn't even staying in that house at the time, and she did know that. Two, Amber had her friend Io poop in the bed for the same reason. As per Johnny's original accusation, despite the fact that Io hadn't even been there that day. And three, Amber's dog Boo pooped in the bed, which we have documented evidence of Boo doing on other occasions. Because the dog was already known to have poor bowel control. So ask yourself right now, which of those explanations makes the most sense? And which of them is the funniest? Well, one of them comes with a fun little pun on someone's name, so... And the last one was Amber Turd, right? <laughs> that, is an, that is another one. And as much as pro Johnny people like to pull the whole did you even watch the trial bullshit, it's pretty obvious that none of them did. At least not the whole thing or not in a particularly attentive kind of way. I mean, the fucking jury didn't watch the whole trial. They fell asleep. The court stenographer for the case said that she only saw one juror who was attentive throughout the whole thing. And that juror was an alternate who never had a say in the verdict. Emily D. Baker made money off of her commentary and still only seemed completely engaged during testimonies that she saw as benefiting Johnny, because when Rocky Pennington was on screen corroborating parts of Amber's story, Emily was fishing through her desk looking for fruit snacks and talking about how the trial got boring all of a sudden. Oh, uh, this right? is the Hicksville. Sorry, I lost I my train of thought. Up. 
I was bored. Now I already played that clip during part one. I also played a clip of Dr. Kirk Honda, AKA psychology in Seattle, who used the dreaded, did you even watch the trial line as his retort against the idea that this trial was bad for women. Despite the fact that I'm pretty sure he didn't watch the whole trial. Cause if you go to the homepage of his channel, he's got his Depp v. Heard playlist pretty prominently featured. It contains 63 videos, including one in which he completely swallows Johnny's allegation that the fight in Australia only happened because Amber was mad that he was getting a post-nup. They asked Johnny Depp if he wanted to get a prenuptial agreement and Johnny Depp said, yeah, I brought it up a number of times, but every time Amber Heard would either avoid the topic or she would get combative with him. And given the profile that the Johnny Depp team is, uh, you know, proposing for Amber Heard, it, it would totally fit in line with that. Johnny Depp has been talking about how he was talking about getting a prenup and that Amber Heard would, re would refuse it. So there are a number of possibilities as to why someone would refuse. One is if you have borderline, then like I said, the suggestion is there that an abandonment might be around the corner. But nowhere on his channel can you find Dr. Honda reacting to the testimony of Michelle Mulrooney, the attorney Amber hired to draft a postnup agreement and whom Johnny called while in Australia to yell at and fire on Amber's behalf without Amber's permission. The question is that he was very mean. Um, that he called me names and that he fired me on behalf of them. Just like he did with her prenup attorney too. Though of course, the notes Amber's therapist wrote about that were excluded as hearsay. Michelle's testimony definitely made it to trial at least. And maybe Dr. Honda watched that part in his own time and didn't upload a reaction to it. But that would mean that he knowingly excluded evidence in favor of Amber in his public coverage of the case after already supporting Johnny's contradictory allegations. And I don't think that that's better. For as much as people like Hassan Piker tried to justify their contribution to all this by being like, I'm a news broadcaster or whatever. Of all the people that thought this case was newsworthy enough to cover in the spring of 2022, the vast majority of them stopped covering it as soon as the jury came to a verdict. Maybe some people covered the Dateline interview Amber did after, you know, just to make fun of her some more. But a majority stopped after that, as if this story was over. Despite the fact that both Amber and Johnny filed appeals, the legal case itself wasn't over until December of 2022, not June. And the settlement the two agreed to was a pretty good deal for Amber. But that's not as interesting to most of the people who covered this case as making fun of her was. In the last year, thousands of pages of unsealed documents have become public, including the therapy notes that Amber complained in her Dateline interview couldn't be admitted because they had been deemed hearsay. All these streamers and commentary channels were so eager to report on the trial when it was being streamed like a TV show, but they apparently didn't care about the case enough to read some fucking PDFs. Even just the 68 pages of Amber's appeal brief, which became totally accessible to the public in November and very clearly and concisely outlines the myriad of problems her team faced in the Fairfax County Court. There's a text message where Johnny promises total global humiliation for you. Do you feel like that came true? I know he promised it. I testified to this. I'm not a, a good victim, I get it. I'm not a likable victim. I'm not a perfect victim, I get it. I'm not a saint. I'm not asking anyone to like me. But when I testified, I asked the jury to just see me as human and hear his own words, which is a promise to do this, a promise to humiliate me, a promise to ruin me. It feels as though he has. I saw what was happening to me in real time. I don't care what one thinks about me um, or what judgments you want to make about what happened in the privacy of my own home and my marriage behind closed doors. I, I don't presume the average person should know those things, and so I don't take it personally, but even somebody who is sure I'm deserving of all this hate and vitriol, even if you think 
that I'm lying, you still couldn't tell me, look me in the eye and tell me that you think on social media there's been a fair representation. You cannot tell me that you think that this has been fair. Hi. So as you can see, I am back in my own apartment. This is where the original conclusion for the video was supposed to come, but I've been editing this for like two-ish weeks now, and I just wasn't super into the conclusion that I filmed before. And a big part of that is that this video is already approaching about three hours long, and I still just have so much more to say. There's a lot of stuff that I left out, a lot of stuff that I kind of touched on but didn't really expand upon. And then because I've been going through all these like YouTube videos and live stream VODs and TikToks and stuff of people talking about this trial, I've been finding other stuff people said about this case that I either forgot about or wasn't really aware of when I made the first draft of the script. And a lot of it is just like, even worse than I thought. And there was a lot that I just wished I had known about a little bit ago so that I could address some of the more absurd commentary that I've come across in the last, like, week and a half. And I'm not gonna go through all of it, obviously, because that would just be way too much, but I am gonna make an example out of one particular creator statement that I've come across in the last week. So throughout this series, I've used a couple different clips from Dr. Honda, aka Psychology in Seattle, including a specific clip that I used earlier where Dr. Honda was making a big thing about those two photos that Amber submitted into evidence that looked like they were the same photo, because I had remembered why watching his content like a year ago and hearing him bring that up like a lot. So I knew those clips were out there when I first made the script, and then when I went to go find them to put them in the video, I found that in, in the clip that I used, there was something else that he said like right after that. Picture side by side, she was claiming over and over again that they were different pictures, but it was obvious. I don't need metadata to know, or I don't even need an overlay to know that those two pictures were the same picture. One had a filter on it. Were the claims that she had been knocked into unconsciousness for several hours on three different occasions, and there was no evidence. In fact, she, would, she took a picture of herself, and she had a bruise on her arm, but no bruising on her face. In watching more of his commentary on this trial, I realized that that is a claim that he has made several times. And when I heard it, I thought, what is he talking about? Now, I was trying to be fair to his statement because even though I've definitely done a lot of research in this case for like a while, there is just a lot of data to sort through and I misremember stuff all the time. I'm constantly finding stuff I somehow missed. And then for this video, I've rewatched a lot of the Fairfax trial and realized that there was a lot of stuff that I forgot was in that trial or that I had thought was in the trial that wasn't in that trial because I was confusing it with like the UK trial or the unsealed documents or even sometimes just other stuff that I saw on social media that didn't really come from any sort of official source. Like, there's just a lot of information that gets jumbled around and it's hard to sort of sort through everything and just get to the bare allegations and the bare evidence. So I was like, okay, maybe there are things about what Amber claimed that I forgot, but... I feel like if Amber had said she was beaten unconscious three times, that I would remember. Because really, I couldn't even remember one time where Amber said that she was beaten unconscious, let alone three. But again, Dr. Honda made this claim on several occasions, and it's so specific. He says three times. He gives a number on it. So I was like, there's got to be something to this, right? And so I knew that Nick Wallace, who is a reporter who did a lot of work in this case in the UK and in the US, had uploaded some transcripts to his website from the US trial. They're unofficial transcripts, but they seem pretty accurate to me. And I was like, well, I'm not going to watch the entire trial again again just to see if Amber made this claim. So instead, I just opened up every single PDF that had any of Amber's testimony, whether direct or cross-examination, from the transcripts from Nick's website. And then I just did a word search. I searched like conscious, unconscious, knocked out, blackout, like anything that I thought might bring up that result of any time Amber said that she was beaten unconscious. And I just... 
couldn't find anything. So then I googled it to see if I could find other people talking about these allegations that Amber apparently made, but the only thing that I could really find was from a Justice for Johnny subreddit, so I decided to go through Dr. Honda's videos reacting to the trial, and then I opened up those transcripts to see if I could find where he might have first made this allegation, or where he might have come up with this idea. And so near as I can tell, the first time he ever brought up this three times unconscious thing was in number 49 of his reaction to this trial. And so I'm just gonna play the whole clip, and as far as I know, this is the first time he said this. Not only is she claiming that she was being beaten, and on three occasions, I counted it, she said that she was beaten to unconsciousness, not just three seconds of unconsciousness. Like one time she said she was beaten that evening and the next day she woke up. She didn't say I just fell asleep. She said I was, I lost consciousness. I don't remember what happened and I woke up in the morning. And then the third time she says, that time I know I had a concussion because I was beaten to unconsciousness, that kind of thing. Including the time when he lost his finger. I think that's one of the, that's that third incident that I'm pretty sure she was talking about. So this is still like incredibly nebulous. I mean, he jumps from the first allegation to the third and I can't quite tell if there's a second one in there or if he just says third twice. I really don't know. And he also just gives very, very few specifics as to what incidents he's talking about. So I have to just kind of piece together what I think he's referring to. And so the first one, he refers to Amber being beaten unconscious and her knowing that because she just woke up the next day. And that, I assume, is that December 2015 incident where Amber says, I was suffocating in this pillow top with him holding me down, punching me over and over, and I don't have any memory after that until I woke up. Now, I would say that that statement is very different from how Dr. Honda describes her account. Because yeah, she didn't say that she just fell asleep, but she also didn't say that she lost consciousness either. She just said that the last thing she remembers is him suffocating her with a pillow and then she woke up. So there's kind of two options there. One, Amber really just doesn't remember what happened after that because it happened five and a half years ago. And it's pretty normal for people in traumatic situations like that to kind of lose memory surrounding the traumatic incident itself. So. It really just could be that Amber doesn't remember, and that's not that weird. Or you could take it as Amber implying that she lost consciousness in that moment. But even then, Dr. Honda makes it seem like these stories are unbelievable because the photos of Amber's injuries don't look like that of someone who was beaten unconscious. But I really don't know, even if Amber was trying to say that she was knocked unconscious in that moment, that that still really makes any sense for Dr. Honda to pick her apart for, because I don't think that Amber would have lost consciousness in that situation because of the beating. I think it's probably more likely that she lost consciousness because she was being suffocated with a pillow. What specific marks do you think you're gonna see from an incident like that? Now after that, Dr. Honda says that Amber at one point said that she knew she had a concussion because she had been beaten unconscious. And he says that that's the third example, but then he also gives a different description of the third example that doesn't seem to be from the same case, but I, I don't know. I'm just going to take this as like example number two rather than example number three. But again, I really don't know what specific incident he's talking about because there are only two incidents where Amber brought up thinking that she had a concussion. She never said she knew she had a concussion. She said she thought she had a concussion. One of those was the December 2015 incident again, where Amber said that she thought she had a concussion and she thought she had a broken nose. But she did a concussion check with Nurse Erin, and I guess she didn't have a concussion. And then the other incident was from August of 2015. And so this is what she says about that. Johnny at one point slapped me in the face in our bedroom in the chateau that we were staying in. At another moment, he punched me across the jaw. At one point, he either pushed or threw. It's hard to describe to you which of those two it is because I can't tell you. I just know I went flying onto this old church furniture. I later thought I had a concussion. It was the first time I thought I had sustained a concussion. So in all the transcripts, when I search the word concussion, these are the only two incidents where Amber brings that up. In neither incident, 
end, does Amber say that she was beaten unconscious? Maybe there's something that I'm missing, but I really don't know where else to look other than the transcripts from Amber's allegations. And Dr. Honda's statements are definitely not helping me, because they are so vague. Now, as I said, Dr. Honda said that that second incident was the third incident. I don't know if he actually was trying to make a distinction between the two of them because of how he words it, but then he also says that um, that was the same time that Johnny injured his finger, which does not seem to make sense with the concussion thing at all. So I'm just going to take that as a separate incident. And the incident where Johnny injured his finger was in Australia, where Amber absolutely never claimed to be knocked unconscious. She said that she took sleeping pills and went to bed. So I really just don't know what Dr. Honda is talking about, but he keeps doing it. He keeps making this claim multiple times. And he keeps saying it in ways that are just so, like, matter of fact. Like, this is something that happened. Amber claimed that she was beaten unconscious three times. Which is pretty ironic because in the first video of this series that I did, I used two clips from Dr. Honda. One of them was when he said the whole, did you even watch the trial thing, which just seems increasingly stupid the more and more I watch of his commentary because I am becoming more and more convinced that he did not watch the trial. And then the other one I used was him saying that he believed both Johnny and Amber were abusive, but that Amber was exaggerating her claims. But after seeing more clips like that, I just don't really think that Amber's claims were exaggerations. I think that Dr. Honda just exaggerated her claims. Because clearly some of the ways that he's portraying her allegations are just not rooted in anything that Amber actually said. And like, part of the reason that this case is so frustrating to research is that I'm always coming across statements like that. People saying things that happened in the trial or things that happened in the relationship or making some claims about evidence that exists that I have to then look into to see if that's legit, if these people are actually referencing something that's real, and then like 75% of the time I don't find anything of substance. Sometimes I even find things that are the complete opposite of true, like multiple people have tried to tell me and they've said it so confidently with the most declarative blunt language possible that Rocky Pennington didn't testify in Fairfax. And it's like, I don't even know what to say to that because yes, she did. There's videos of her testimony. There's live streamers reacting to it. It's even clear that she was questioned on multiple days because you can see her outfits change in the videos. And a lot of that just comes from like randos on Twitter and stuff. But when it comes from people like Dr. Honda, who is being looked at as a, a sort of person with authority on this subject because he's talking about something related to his field, which is psychology, it just gets even more disheartening because it's like, how many people that consume Dr. Honda's content regularly are just going to completely ingest that claim from him, despite the fact that he pretty clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. And it's the same thing with Hassan Piker saying that the judge in the UK victim blamed Johnny and said that he deserved to have his finger cut off because he does so many drugs or something. And I really, I love that clip because it starts with Hassan saying, nobody talks about this, but... And like, yeah, no one talks about it, Hassan, because it didn't happen. But that's a great way for him to undermine the entire UK verdict. Because even if he's not directly spreading the conspiracy theory that Amber Heard had some sort of connection to the UK trial and that was biased in her favor from the beginning, anytime someone brings up the UK verdict to be like, hey, Johnny Depp probably is a wife beater, they can just remember what Hassan said. And what Hassan said was, yeah, Johnny Depp did lose that case, but the trial was definitely fucked up and biased in Amber's favor. Not because Amber had this super secret conspiratorial connection with the judge, but because the judge just hated Johnny because of his alcoholism or something. And then it feeds into this anti-mainstream media, anti-journalism narrative of like, oh yes, all the big outlets will talk about 
about this case, but they won't talk about this super secret thing that I discovered. They're lying to you. They're not telling you what actually happened. But there's three points that I really wanted to make about this kind of commentary from people like Hassan or Dr. Honda. The first point is that people get their information from content creators. The fact that this case involves celebrities has prompted a lot of discussion about the parasocial relationships that people have with Johnny and Amber, but I don't think we've talked enough about the parasocial relationships that viewers have to YouTubers and Twitch streamers, and how that absolutely contributed to how people thought of this case. Because Psychology in Seattle made over 60 videos talking about Depthy Heard from the perspective of a professional psychologist. He's also separately uploaded videos of himself and his reoccurring co-host working through their personal beef and crying and hugging and connecting. So Dr. Honda's viewers don't just trust him as a professional, they trust him as a person, a person who wouldn't lie to them. And that's the same with Hassan, who offers commentary on politics and media, while also talking about how he's training his new puppy, who is very, very cute. These people mean a lot to their audiences. Viewers trust them as a source of mostly reliable information. And yet, while analyzing this case that specifically revolved around allegations of domestic violence, for which misinformation was already becoming overwhelming on social media, they were uploading videos or doing live streams with tens of thousands to millions of viewers spreading more misinformation. Because so many content creators barely knew what they were talking about with this case, and didn't really seem to think that they needed to. Which brings us to the second point, which is that human memory is pretty unreliable. I haven't been right about everything about this case the entire time. I have constantly written statements, filmed them, edited them, and then when trying to find a source or some sort of screenshot to put up as an example, have realized that I misremembered something, or I got something a little bit wrong in terms of my wording or in terms of the source that I used that maybe wasn't super reliable. And when I catch that stuff, I do try to cut it out. But I'm sure that even in this video, I've said something else that wasn't 100% correct. Especially given the fact that I am the only person working on this content, stuff is gonna slip through the cracks. And I will do my best to correct that, but this is why traditional journalism, as flawed as individual institutions are, is still so fucking important. We need outlets that are burdened to fact check everything, and who have teams and editors to help them do it. This is one of the major problems of Adam Waldman empowering random social media influencers to become internet journalists that he gives exclusive information to. And this is also why, by the way, it was absolutely absurd that the Depthy Heard jury wasn't allowed to have transcripts in the deliberation. Because when Dr. Honda said the thing about Amber losing consciousness three times, the only reason that I feel so certain that he is wrong is because I was able to check the transcripts. I could go back and rewatch the entire trial if I wanted to, to make sure that I knew that Dr. Honda was incorrect. But if him and I had been in that deliberation room together, and he said that to me and said it so matter-of-factly and confidently, if all I could do was go off my my own memory and my own notes from the trial, I probably would have believed him. Especially when you consider the fact that that jury was allegedly falling asleep during certain moments of the trial, they're probably very impressionable. Now moving on to the third reason that I bring this up, and I want to make it really, really clear, I'm not trying to pick on anyone. A lot of the content creators that I've shown clips from in these three videos are content creators that I like, including Dr. Honda, who I am a patron for. I also pay for a membership for the H3 podcast, and there's kind of a funny connection between H3 and psychology in Seattle for me that I, I thought about while while putting all this together, the first episodes that I ever saw or listened to from these different creators was about the exact same topic. And in case I haven't isolated and pissed off enough people, that topic was the HBO documentary Leaving Neverland, a documentary that dealt with some 
pretty horrifying allegations against a very famous man, and I was just very disturbed by the reaction that I kept seeing to it on social media, in the same way that I was disturbed by the reaction that I saw to Depp v. Heard, where it wasn't just that people disbelieved the men who were profiled in that documentary, but in how they went about arguing their defense of Michael Jackson. There was a lot of victim-blaming rhetoric, there was a lot of halo effect in terms of how people were talking about Michael's legacy, there was a lot of people putting way too much faith into the institutions that investigate cases like these, and it was just like bad talking points all around. So it was really, really refreshing to me when I found H3 talking about it and then I found Psychology in Seattle talking about it because they were talking about that case in a much more informed way that was a lot more compassionate to the alleged victims. And so to see both of them talk about Amber Heard's allegations in the ways that they did, it was really, really gross. Now granted, H3 never really took a stance on the trial. I mean, they were kind of just making a joke out of it and trolling a lot. I mean, they definitely did buy into the whole Amber Turd thing, but for the most part, they weren't really even doing any sort of substantive commentary on it, but it still was just horrible. Because no matter how silly the superficial aspects of this seemed and how weird of a spectacle it became online, it was still a case that involved allegations of rape and abuse that should have always been treated just a lot more seriously than it was. And so it just made me really sad. I'm sad for what it says about how easily influenceable and corruptible human beings are, because while Dr. Honda was acting like he was trying to approach this topic with empathy and compassion, he was also going on podcasts that were advertising an Amber Turd promo code. And it it's just disgusting to me. But outside of larger concerns about the state of misinformation on the internet and how things like this get proliferated by internet content creators. The real reason that it makes me as sad as it does is that even the people I would have expected to show Amber Heard support and kindness weren't even, like, feeding her to the wolves. They became the wolves. And Amber Heard didn't deserve that. She never deserved that. And I think the reason it's been hard for me to make a proper conclusion to all of this is that in my own writing and in my videos and whatnot, what I usually am trying to do is I'm trying to take smaller moments in pop culture and I'm trying to kind of widen the lens on it and put it into a proper, like, social, cultural context. And that's really hard to do in this case. For one thing, because I think this trial was just massive in terms of its cultural impact. And a lot of that impact relates to internet culture, something that is very new in our society. I don't think that we're going to be able to fully process what happened here for years. I just don't think that we have a distanced enough perspective of it yet. I know there's all these documentaries and books and retrospectives about the trial coming out this year, in 2023, a year after the trial took place, and I think that's kind of like if ESPN had tried to make and release their Made in America series about O.J. Simpson in 1996. It just wouldn't have really made sense. There is a reason that that miniseries came out two decades after that trial. And beyond that, the deeper that I get into the research for Depp v. Heard, the less I care about what it all means. Especially because even before the trial was finished, that is what every major outlet was talking about. The day after the verdict, Time Magazine published an article called The Depp Heard Trial Perpetuates the Myth of the Perfect Victim. The same day, the New York Times published a piece called The Johnny Depp Amber Heard Verdict is Chilling, where that article had a lot to do with the effect the trial would have on 
other victims of domestic violence. And then four days after the verdict, Guardian published, What did Depp v. Heard teach us? That justice and reality TV are incompatible. While the trial was going on, The Atlantic used it as an opportunity to talk about the rise of anti-fandoms. Lots of outlets were talking about the profitability of the case from an online content perspective. They were tying it in with the rise in true crime and internet sleuthing. And of course, there were conversations about the misogyny inherent in the discourse and the harassment that Amber and a lot of her supporters received. Every different way that this case could be talked about on a macro level, major publications were talking about it. Of course, while the trial was going on, they couldn't be bothered to do any sort of investigative reporting on the specific false claims that were spreading all across social media. They made very little effort to thoroughly debunk the things being said online. Like, I don't even know how many outlets republished TMZ's original claims from 2016 that the person who arrested Amber Heard in 2009 was a lesbian. Because I have never seen any evidence that those claims were ever verified. And while under oath at Fairfax, that woman never claimed to be a retired police officer. She just said that she worked at the airport. While Amber said in 2016 that the person who arrested her was a man. And that's overall just a pretty small thing, but it's representative of a larger problem where no one was bothering to verify the things that a lot of people on social media just immediately accepted as truth. There should have been outlets last year that were running real-time fact checks on the myths that were spreading online, but there weren't. And it wasn't because outlets weren't talking about the trial. It was that they were only talking about it as this chaotic internet phenomenon. Like there was this fire ravaging the country that they could only stand by and watch in horror, despite the fact that they were the ones holding the hoses. Because everybody profited from this. The content creators who were helping to spread the misinformation that got the whole internet to turn on Amber. And the outlets putting out think pieces about how mean everyone was being to her and how much this case was going to affect other victims of domestic violence. And obviously, stuff like that does matter. But what also matters is Amber Heard and the fact that she didn't deserve this. And not just because nobody does. Amber Heard specifically didn't deserve this. In her own words, one of the most destructive things that Johnny did to Amber in his abuse of her was repeatedly tell her that no one likes her. It got really nasty. It went from like, oh, no one likes you. No one likes me. Everyone warned me about you. That's what it was. He started to tell me that everyone had warned him about me and that he wished he had never married me, wish he had never met me. Um, no, no one liked me, you know, it sounds uh, childish, but uh, I, I, I remember feeling really hurt. But that's not true. There were definitely times in the last year where it seemed like the entire internet and the entire world was against her. But she always did have some communities of support. They were small and dealt with a lot of harassment themselves, but they were there. Some of them even showed up to the courthouse to defend her. Watching this, it just, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart the way that she's being forced to relive all of this in front of the world and they just hate her for it. That breaks my heart. I mean, she already did the trial in 2020. I mean, she like leaves court every day and people just shout at her like obscenities saying, I don't believe you every day. People made it into a funny TikTok trend to dance and act out her sexual assault testimony. It's just, I mean, it's just sick. Why do you think more people that support her aren't here? I mean, that's kind of why we started the Twitter account. I was shocked that no one was doing anything. Mm. I didn't get it. <laughs> I still don't. 
and there were a handful of content creators who stuck their neck outs either to defend her allegations or just offer her some amount of compassion and understanding. I don't know how you're not embarrassed, humiliated, and disturbed by yourself if you decided to engage in making fun of an abuse survivor retelling her abuse. I have no idea how you fall asleep at night knowing you've participated in a trend on TikTok mocking somebody's abuse. I have no idea how you sleep at night, but you guys are still here the next day. So clearly, clearly you're going to sleep and I don't know how. I don't know how. I don't, I don't know how you look in the mirror every morning and see yourself moving the goalposts for abuse survivors until it literally is under fucking water and not think that it will jump past you one day, God forbid. So you can get on TikTok and talk about you want this, this she's detailing what a famous fucking pirate did to her and you're talking about that's so hot. I don't know. I don't know how you can sit seriously and do that, but you guys do. And I think it's shameful. Today, over 300 individuals and organizations who are experts and activists in the fields of domestic violence or women's rights signed an open letter in support of Amber. There were a lot of people in the industry who rallied around Johnny Depp during or after the trial, but I think that Amber got the celebrity support that really mattered, that of Bernard the Elf from the Santa Claus franchise. David Crumholtz worked with Amber on the Playboy Club, a show, by the way, that I cannot find fucking anywhere. But he wrote on his Instagram story last year, Amber Heard is a victim of abuse by Johnny Depp. Drugs and alcohol turn men into monsters. I believe Amber Heard. She is not innocent, but she is a victim. Johnny Depp's smugness during the trial is sickening. I worked with Amber Heard. She is not psychotic. She is brilliant and strong and got caught up in bullshit. And despite what he's tried to imply, a lot of people in Johnny Depp's life actually liked Amber, like his mother and his kids. He told Elton John in 2013 that his kids had fallen head over heels in deep love with her. And in February of 2014, Lily Rose Depp sent Johnny a text pretty much begging him not to break up with Amber. She said, you've been a better dad to Jack and I since she has been around, and she was helping with the alcohol problem. I see what a positive effect she's had on you, and I'm afraid those things will leave with her. You've been so much better since she's been around. And Camille Vasquez can say whatever she wants about Amber burning bridges and her close friends not showing up for her. But there are so many moments in the video testimonies from Amber's friends where they are clearly sad about the abuse they watched her go through. What is this document, Miss Pennington? It's a photo of Amber's face with two black eyes towards the end when the um, physical abuse was more evident. Um, I was worried. I, I was worried for her physical safety. I was worried that when he turned he might accidentally do something that was worse than he ever intended. He came plomping back down the stairs. I heard like a noise and then the phone dropped. And um, he said to her, oh, you think I hit you? You think I fucking hit you? What if I peel your fucking hair back? And then I heard the phone drop again, and then I heard her scream. Does this picture fairly and accurately depict, um, at least in part, Miss Heard's appearance on that night in December 15, 2015? Yes. What is this picture? This is Amber's face <laughs> turned a profile, um, showing more of her bottom bloody lip <clears throat> and her right bruised eye. And I hung up the phone and I called Raquel immediately because I know that she lives one door away and would her and her boyfriend, Josh, who's a big dude, would be able to get there the fastest. And then I called <clears throat> a friend of mine in LA who I knew had met Amber a number of times and 
Was it the first meeting that you had with Ms. Hurd in August this year that she mentioned that? No, it was, it was after, like, I... I had come to see her and had a wine night and catch up. And then I, after I had talked to the attorneys, after we had a good cry, she, we were talking more about what had happened and she was saying how she didn't even tell me any, everything. And yeah, that's when it came out. I, I take it from your response today, you still feel very emotional about this. It's very difficult for you, isn't it? It's not difficult for me, no, now, no, but uh, it just remind me at the time how I felt, yes. I don't think I even slept that night watching her just to make sure she didn't. <sighs> Is that because you were worried she had a concussion? Yes. When Amber needed your help, you tried to be there for her, right? Yes. I was scared for Amber. I was sad for her and I was also sad for Johnny. She is my friend too. And I really wanted them to be able to get it together. They're sad because they cared about her. Because Amber Heard is someone worth caring about. Obviously, I don't know her, but at this point, after reading hundreds of pages worth of therapy notes and text messages and listening to hours of audio recordings, I think I know Amber Heard about as intimately as anyone can know a public figure they've never met. And so much of the stuff that I've seen people shitting on her for during the trial are really just representative of some of her best qualities, in my opinion. Like, people said that she was looking at the jury too much and... That was just a part of her manipulative behavior or something, or her searching for validation. And that's already a very frustrating criticism because a lot of lawyers will advise you while you're on the stand to look at the jury while you answer your questions. That's not an unheard of thing at all. It's also something that other witnesses were doing during the trial, including Dr. Curry, by the way, who I think did it about as much as Amber. But beyond that, Amber Heard is someone who as a teenager became fluent in ASL because she had friends who were deaf. She's someone whose dad had a construction company that mostly hired Spanish-speaking workers, so she became fluent in Spanish. And in videos of Amber's overseas activism, you can see her trying to speak the languages of the locals there. We am. Show us, Mac. We am. We am? It's me, Amber. It is clearly important to Amber for her to feel like she can communicate with people in their first languages, and I think that that's nice. Yo en ningún momento vi una actitud de, de, de digamos, una mala cara, una mal, un mal gesto. Al contrario, ella se preocupaba por conocer ser el nombre de todo el mundo en la producción para poder llamarlo por el nombre, sea actor, sea el de la luz, sea el de maquillaje. Se llevó muy bien con las maquillistas. Yo me acuerdo que una vez la fui a llamar para su escena y en, dentro de su, donde se cambiaba, estaban cantando, estaban bailando. Eh, por eso me sorprendió tanto, ¿no? El, el, el juicio. Porque en ningún momento, incluso una vez me invitó a comer a su casa, a la casa que le alquilamos aquí en Guatemala, y estábamos cocinando y un día, una noche, estaba, eh, estaban los jardineros, los meseros, las empleadas y los invitó a todos a sentarse con nosotros. Nos, nos sirvió vino a todos y dijo que toda la, la cena iba a ser en español para que ellos pudieran estar incluidos en la conversación. Eh, se levantó y les dio como una, un agradecimiento a todos por haberla recibido, a enseñarles un montón de cosas. Entonces, genuinamente fue una persona muy linda. And so it doesn't surprise me that when she's on the stand, that she wants to look at the jury while she's talking, because Amber Heard seems like a person who doesn't want to be communicating through a translator or some kind of buffer. She knows that the jurors are the people she's ultimately talking to, so why wouldn't she look at them? Amber Heard is not perfect. She is reactive, self-destructive, sometimes kind of mean, but she is nowhere near as villainous as a lot of people have tried to make her out to be. She didn't pull a gone girl. She went and filed for a restraining order, after which Johnny's lawyers called her a liar and said that she was making up allegations for money. 
while Johnny was texting people trying to get her fired from Aquaman, and she still decided to put out a joint statement with him and sign an NDA saying that she was never going to talk about the allegations again. An NDA that she stuck to, by the way, while Johnny was calling her a liar again in a GQ interview. She has truthfully handled this with an amount of grace that I think is fucking astounding. She was dragged into the center of a massive hate campaign, and still, when people come up to her on the street and ask her for a photo, she takes them, and she smiles, and she's polite. Knowing that some of those people are making fun of her, like Raven fucking Simone. It's weird. We are charging our Tesla right now, and I swear to God, the girl next to the next to us right now was Amber Heard and her lesbian lover. Oh my God! Cut her, cut my finger off, and she she'll claim it. Oh my God, you're so good. <laughs> she is, and she's also filming herself. She's probably talking to a lawyer. Look at her. She's probably up. like calling the cops on us, being that we're filming and talking about her. You know she can feel it. No, she really can't. Oh my God. Her girlfriend, can feel her it. girlfriend looks like Johnny Depp right now. Oh my God. Okay, so I just took a picture with Amber Heard. <laughs> this one right here. She goes, dare me. Dare me to dare go me. take a picture. And I was like, okay, she's like, do it now or I'm not going to do it. I was like, okay, fine, I dare you. And she went and she took a photo with Amber Heard. But let me tell you the best part. So Amber gets out of her Tesla. And when she walked back up, I noticed that she didn't have her car key. She had to open her car through the app. Okay, perfect. She gets out of the car, takes a picture with Raven, and closes her door. Mm. Which then means as soon as Raven walks away, she goes back to get in her car, and her car is locked. With her phone inside, her purse inside, the snacks that she was nibbling on, and her jacket. And I watched this woman try to keep it cool and just try and act like she meant to get out of her car and close the door turn around and then she's just like there and for that i think she's incredible i'll just say this i'm so happy that amber went through something so awful and and it didn't change her as a person she's still the shining sparkling light that that you explained earlier and to go through something that terrible and be able to come out the other side and be whole and still be that, that shining star, I, I can't imagine. Anyone who <laughs> suffers that sort of ordeal and is able with grace to overcome it, no matter what side you're on, no matter yeah. what you believe, whatever, which social media you plug into or whatever your hashtags are, you have to give credit but the incredible uh, journey this woman has been through. And she can teach us all a couple of things as far as resilience and courage. And uh, Pascal Borna wanted her to be here at this festival. We wanted so much for her to have this experience about this, this work, her work. Her work that is not just saying the lines, but bringing us together and cheering us on. Um, I'm inspired and I'm moved deeply by what she's teaching us every day, just being out there smiling and making sure that we're all all right, by the way. She's like, are you okay? Where's is, where is your wife? Is she here? Um, can we move? Like, you know, where is, you know, yeah. is everybody in the car? I mean, like, she's like, literally. Yeah, uh, looking out for everybody else. Like, <laughs> looking out for everybody else. You know, my daughter's been here for three days, and, you know, she's like, come, you need to get dressed? Come, come to my room. Like, you know, she is incredible. All of this nonsense cloud over her, and there she is, just being her. You know, Savannah, as silly as it is to say this out loud, my goal, the only thing I could hope for at this point, is just want people to see me as a human being.